coś. No. Wow. No. A mi nie służy. No dobra. To wyłączy tylko teraz? Dobra, nie było. Raz, raz. Good morning, everyone. I have a great pleasure to start uh, the second day of the 13 student conference. Uh, let's start with uh, two presentations from the Laboratory of Protein Biochemi Biochemistry. The first speaker, Carolina Milch. tell you about uh, my uh, master's project, which I did in laboratory of uh, protein biochemistry under the supervision of Dr. Szymon Dziętkiewicz. Może opowiem dowcip. Glutamine okay. so, uh, synthetase catalyzes the first steps in which uh, the nitrogen is uh, um, introduced into a cellular metabolism via ATP, dependent conversion of glutamate and ammonia to glutamine. Uh, GS is mainly found in uh, uh, brain uh, where it uh, provides a mechanism for ammonia uh, assimilation and detoxification as well as um, 
the uh, glutamine biosynthesis and neurotransmitter signal termination. Uh, glutamine synthetase um, is homo uh, homoligo or oligomeric protein consisting of uh, 8, 10 or 12 subunits uh, with each subunit subunit interface has on its own uh, active site. Um, uh, GS form uh, dodecamer in archaea and bacteria and decamer in uh, eukaryota. Um, uh, GS decamer has uh, 10 active sites and uh, <coughs> has 10 active sites uh, uh, each uh, located and, uh, uh, and at the junction of uh, two adjacent uh, pentamers, uh, pentamers uh, subunits in the pentamer ring. Um, uh, N terminal uh, domain interact with uh, C terminal uh, catalytic domain of uh, the next uh, uh, subunit, uh, thus forming a funnel shaped uh, pocket and the funnel points outwards uh, uh, in the pentameric ring. Uh, since the two uh, pentameric ring uh, are stayed stacked uh, back to back. Um, the second, uh, uh, the uh, active sites in the second uh, pentamer are oriented in the opposite direction. In the patient with neurological disorder, uh, disorders, uh, GS mutation, uh, not yet described in the lit literature, uh, was found. Uh, a new, newly discovered variant of human glutamine synthetase has a mutation in the uh, codon start, resulting in uh, expression of protein uh, starting from the uh, second methionine, uh, missing uh, initial 17 uh, uh, amino acids. Uh, it corresponds to alpha helix facing uh, the center of pentameric ring. It uh, seems uh, appropriate uh, to uh, characterize uh, biochemically uh, delta N70 variants and compare it uh, to uh, white type human glutamine synthetase. Uh, to study both proteins, I uh, produced them in bacterial system and purified them. Um, I produced uh, the GS uh, 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 white type was expressed in a different strain of E. coli uh, than Delta N17 because there was a problem with uh, uh, overproduction in one strain. Uh, Cruciferous hydroxypatase and molecular filtration was used to protein purification. Uh, previous liter literature uh, methods uh, used to uh, determine um, uh, the activity of the GS was the base, were based on um, uh, determination of uh, um, emerging glutamate. Uh, to make measurement uh, take place in real uh, time, be cheaper and faster, I uh, created the new protocol uh, converting uh, the method from Norby's publication. And uh, I uh, modified this method so that ATP hydrolysis uh, is affected by adding uh, ammonia and glutamate. In the end, NADH is measure, measured uh, spectrophotometrically at uh, four, uh, 340 nanometers. Uh, as we can see, there is no differ significant differences in uh, the GS white type and GS delta N70 variants. So uh, deletion has no effect on um, uh, enzymatic activity. However, it is crucial for um, uh, it is crucial for uh, stability of the structure, thermal characterization uh, of uh, oligomer. Oligomer stability 
uh, was performed by measuring tryptophan fluorescent shift uh, by uh, Tycho uh, nanotemper. And we can see that uh, already at the beginning of the measured uh, measurement, um, uh, structure of delta N70 variants uh, is more relaxed. Uh, in case of this form, uh, the naturation occur in uh, 50 uh, degrees Celsius and um, Y type uh, uh, loses his structure uh, at uh, 63 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, in addition, I performed a uh, uh, molecular filtration to check both proteins, uh, structure of both proteins in four uh, uh, Celsius degrees. Um, and uh, here we can see that uh, GS uh, Y type remains uh, in the form of the camera, but uh, the GS delta N70 variant occur in a form of uh, uh, decamer and also monomer. Uh, to sum up, there is no significant differences in activity between the GS delta N70 variants and the GS uh, um, Y type variant. But, however, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are differences in the stability of structure of both proteins. The GS delta N70 uh, structure is less stable than the GS uh, white type structure. Thank you for your attention and uh, feel free to ask a question. Thank you, Carolina. We have a time for the one question. Okay, so the question is, do you know anything about this variation in other uh, primate species? So, uh, so in, you know, in gorilla, chimpanzee, and stuff like that. So we can, you can tell whether this is the variable region of the protein or more conserved region. Uh, Did you ever try to use into other genomes? Uh, about this mutation, I know ab only from human because it's uh, newly discovered in two uh, patients in Warsaw. Uh, but uh, uh, if uh, we talk about uh, uh, this uh, protein, uh, it's, uh, um, I think it's conserved in uh, other uh, species. No, this protein is conserved. The question is whether the mutation ever occurred in know. other genomes. In I recent mm -hmm. nature, that there is actually a new results when they sequence 50 different genomes of uh, primates. And now th in database, you can actually check with a mutation like this is across different uh, species related to human. It's this position conserved or variable. That's, so th this, was, this is a question and comment as well. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you. Uh, next speaker. Uh, Marek Bulczak from the same laboratory. Delta N17, from acquisition to the testing, of the heterogenic mixture of human glue protein and its pathogenic variant expressed in the same cell. Uh, welcome to my master thesis. I am Mark Bulczak. My supervisor is the Dr. Szymon Sienkiewicz. And let's move on to the glutamine synthetase that we were previously talking. The glutamine synthetase main function, because this is a dual function enzyme, the main function of this protein is actually removing the uh, ammonia from the brain, uh, muscle, and also liver. As you can see here, uh, glutamine synthetase consists of 10 subunits creating a homodecamer. And this homodecamer has a active site uh, where those uh, uh, units, subunits are close to each other. So there are 10 active sites in the decamer. Mm. A newly discovered patient at the uh, Medical University of Warsaw has a mutation in the starting codon that 
ends with a deletion at the end terminals of the first 17 amino acids. Thus, in the entire decamer, there are 170 amino acids missing. The region in which this deletion is occurring is the center of our protein. Uh, the mutation is heterogenic. That way, uh, the patient has the wild type and the, mutate, uh, the mutant at the same time. So let's go to my aim of the study. The aim of the study was the establishing a method for obtaining the GS wild type and the GS delta N17 in the same cell. So we have the same situation as our patient and also comparing its stability and activity properties to the wild type and delta N17 mixtures. Let's go to the workflow. My workflow, workflow starts with the choice of the organism. Then of course the optimization of the overproduction and purification methods. I'm sorry if I'm not pointing this right because I, I am colorblind, Brian, so I don't see it <laughs> that much as you. And at the end, the stability measurement and the measurement of the activity of those mixtures. So let's start with the transformation and procedure optimization. Here you have a transformation table. I have used hemocompetent and electrocompetent bacteria from the five strains because the transformation happened to be problematic and also three uh, plasmids uh, that were the most important. And in here, as you can see, the BL21DE3 is the most optimal one to have the co-transformants and then the co-expression. To the right, I was trying to optimize the concentration of the inductor and also the time of the induction. And as you, as you can see, the concentration was not uh, changing anything in uh, the expression. Also, uh, there was a depletion after the three hours of the over, uh, overproduction possibilities for the strain because there is no bigger uh, overproduction over the longer period. So let's go to the overproduction. I have once again uh, tested my strains and as you can see, once again, the BL21DE3 is the most optimal because it has the same amount or near the same amount of both of those proteins, so just as our patient has in the Warsaw. And of course, I have tried to use the Western blood to be sure that this is the protein of my interest, and as you can see, both of those are here visible. Okay, the purification was actually uh, mostly uh, connected with the French press, so there was less degradation than in sonification. Also, the q fast protein liquid chromatography and the molecular filtration. Uh, the photo here you can see is after the molecular filtration and as you can see I have acquired my uh, pure protein, uh, both of those uh, uh, standards, those variants, both the mutant and both the wild type from the same cell E. coli. So let's go to the stability measurement. Here we have a thermostability and as previously mentioned here you can see uh, this uh, shift from, uh, from the elements. And as you can see, this element here is a destabilization of decamer. Uh, here is bigger graph having a derivative from those data. And in here, the local uh, maximum is actually the place of this shift uh, of this inflect. So in here, you can see our uh, the stabilization of the decamer of the wild type glutamine synthetase. And as you can see for the co-expression, the maximum is shifted to the left. That way we know that there are heterodecamers in the situation when we have a co-expression in the same cell. So the thermostability for the wild type was about 64 uh, degrees Celsius, but for our co-expression, it was about 59. Uh, in the future research, I'll have to go with the activity comparison. As you can see, I have made the first steps to it, but uh, I would like to make it a little bit more uh, complex. Next would be the time-related loss of function of our co-expression, and of course, the MN2 ion-related activity differences, because the protein, is its activity is connected with those ions also. Conclusions. First, it is possible to achieve the co-expression in E. coli BL21DE3. Next, of course, the heterodecamers do appear when both protein variants are expressed in the same cell. 
Next, the heterodecamers are less stable than wild type decamer, though more stable than the delta N decamer. As you would see in here, we have also a only delta N17 decamer. And of course, initial activity tests in my situation indicate differences between three subjects mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mara, great talk. Uh, have you got any questions? I have a question about your pre preliminary uh, results on the activity of the proteins. Yes. Yeah, here. Uh, you showed that the wild type and deletion have similar activity, but the co-expression has somehow lower, lower activity than any of these two. Do you mm -hmm. have any hypothesis why, why is it observed like that? Well, actually, uh, about those uh, studies that I have here, about the compa activity comparison, I would like to uh, once again uh, do it, so I'm, pretty, I'm, so I'm sure that this is the right situation. But when I'm thinking about it, there is a possibility that subunits of delta N and subunits of wild type are somehow not as uh, great at creating this decamer, that way, the activity is also shifted. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Okay, I would like to ask about this mutation, N17, uh, about um, how, how of, uh, often it occurs. Uh, in this situation, actually, we have two patients having it. And of course, we don't know in other species if it actually exists. So the next step, I think, would be finding how often it actually is in human. Because right now, we don't know. We just know that there are two patients with those neurological disorders. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker uh, is Jacek Sobczak from the Laboratory of Protein Biochemistry. So this was true because there was like a change, but... There was a change, okay. Yeah. Okay, Przemysław Domański from the uh, Laboratory of Evolutionary Biochemistry. <coughs> okay, so I'm Przemysław Domański. I'm doing my master thesis in Laboratory of Evolutionary Biochemistry. My supervisor is Bartłomiej Tomiczek. And my subject of my presentation is investigating amyloid beta 42 recognition by J domain proteins using computational thermodynamics. Uh, so, Alzheimer's disease is most common type of dementia, and it is characterized by the formation of amyloid flux in the brain. According to the amyloid hypothesis, um, amyloid beta 42 is the main cause of this disease. And that's because it is the main component of those amyloid flux, and also it can damage synapses and neurons during aggregation. But what is this amyloid beta 42? So it's a peptide composed of 42 amino acids, and here below you can see sequence. Then first 10 amino acids, so this red region, of each peptide are unstructured, and further ones uh, adopt this uh, beta turn beta conformation, and we can call it a core, core of amyloid. And the most important thing here is that amyloid beta 42 has a strong tendency to aggregate into amyloid fiber. However, j domain proteins can inhibit this amyloid process formation, and it's, uh, it was shown that various proteins of the j domain protein family can uh, have uh, anti-aggregation or disaggregation activity. So j domain proteins family is one of the largest and also most diverse group of proteins. And uh, based on their structure, we can distinguish three classes, A, B, and C. And we can uh, see that there are some common features. So the first thing is this j domain, and this is this purple, uh, dark purple color. Uh, so, it acti so it stimulates mm, ATPase activity of ATP70 
Then we got a uh, glycine phenyl alanine rich region, so this lighter purple color. Uh, and it performs mainly structural functions. And finally, we got also this dimerization domain in A, E, and B class. And this is this alpha helical gray uh, structure. So um, it, uh, is, it is present because those proteins uh, form functional uh, homodimer. Now this, uh, this client binding domain can differ depending on class. So first we got class A domain proteins and they contain two beta barrels uh, that you can see here and here and on this model. Uh, and those uh, beta barrel domains CTD1 and CTD2 uh, form hydrophobic pockets which are substrate binding sites. Now we can also see that in C-terminal domain one there is this uh, zinc binding region and also uh, DNAJA2 has been identified as a suppressor of amyloid fibril aggregation. So now we got class BJ domain proteins and here we cannot uh, longer, no, cannot see this uh, zinc binding uh, region anymore. Also those C-terminal domains are much more similar to each other. Uh, again, those uh, form hydrophobic pockets, which are substrate binding sites. And uh, in cooperation with uh, HSP70, DNA JB1 can disaggregate amyloid fibrils. So we do know that amyloid, that J domain proteins can interact with amyloid. However, we do not know a lot about this certain mechanism. So during my mm, research, I wanted to predict those amino acid residues that are crucial for this process. And also I wanted to check how the structural differences between two classes can interact, can affect this interaction with amyloid beta 42. So let's quickly go through the research methods. So I started by creating model of amyloid beta 42. I downloaded the core of this amyloid and then I rebuilt missing residues. Then I created models of C-terminal domains of J-domain proteins and I used uh, alpha fold to, to do that. Then I was observing binding of j domain proteins to amyloid beta 42 uh, in molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, after that, I had to pull those j domain proteins away from amyloid beta 42 to finally perform um, umbrella sampling simulation to, applain, to obtain free energy profile. Now we got results. So. Uh, this is a complex of DNA JB1 and amyloid beta 42. We can see that only mm, C terminal domain one is involved in this process and also that it interacts only with those mm, unstructured regions of amyloid. Uh, here I highlighted those crucial residues that I found crucial. So I would like to note that Mm, those hydrophobic residues are the most important because as I said earlier, uh, those, th mm, those beta barrels form hydrophobic mm, pockets which are substrate binding sites. And uh, I would like to note that they are like inside this beta barrel mm, and those other residues mostly strengthen this uh, interaction with amyloid beta and uh, it, uh, those like mm, other residues than those hydrophobic mm, allow binding to more hydrophilic regions of amyloid beta 42. And now we got the interesting part. So DNA JA2 uh, complex with amyloid beta 42. Uh, in addition to this uh, C terminal domain one mm, interaction with those uh, unstructured regions of amyloid, we can also see that uh, this zinc binding region can uh, interact with terminal chains of the amyloid, not only with those unstructured regions, but also with this part of, mm, of the core of amyloid. Here I again marked those residues, and now we can see that they, they, those, there are like more of those residues, and also uh, I would like to note that those hydrophobic residues are more evenly Mm, located on C terminal domain one, like this one is kind of outside. And uh, other thing is that I marked a lot of those residues mm, that are located in this zinc uh, binding region. Finally, we got free energy profiles. So basically, when delta G is negative, 
process can occur spontaneously. So we can easily say that both proteins bind to mm, amyloid beta 42. And also the important thing is that the lower energy minimum is, the most energy stable complex is. So we can easily say that DNA JA2 binds to the amyloid much more stronger than DNA JB1. And to conclude, both A and B J domain protein class can interact with unstructured regions of the amyloid. And this is through those hydrophobic residues uh, located on mm, C terminal domain one. And also, class A J domain proteins uh, bind more strongly to amyloid uh, because of this uh, interaction between uh, terminal chains of the amyloid and uh, zinc binding region of. DNA J A2. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Dominique. Uh, now we have time only for one question. So, okay. So I have the question about the uh, JB1 protein. Uh, Yes, uh, uh, as it's shown here. Uh, so you mean that the uh, the uh, unstructured domain of the amyloid uh, enters inside the beta barrel? Yes. Okay. Uh, to it binds certainly to those to those uh, free residues. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. from the Laboratory of Evolutionary um, Biochemistry. Floor is yours. So welcome everybody on my today's presentation. Today I would like to present you my master project research about J-domain proteins and their biochemical characterization uh, in aspect of, of binding the amyloids from Alzheimer's disease. My research was done in Laboratory of Evolutionary Biochemistry under Bartomei Tomicek's supervision. So protein folding is the crucial process in the cell and it can be described on free energy landscape when unfolded polypeptides in standard condition choose the native state conformation of protein. But uh, under the stress condition, they can aggregate to form amorphous aggregates which has a random structure or amyloid fibrils which uh, has the strict defined structure with um, beta sheet motif. What's important that amyloids are presented in neurodegenerative neuro diseases, and one uh, example of this is beta-42 uh, amyloid from Alzheimer's disease. What uh, cells do to defend, to defend from this aggregate? So they have chaperone proteins. One of these is heat shock protein HSP70, which has a lot of function in the cell that can be called as housekeeping activities. But my research is focused on street-related street activities such as uh, protein aggregation prevention, disaggregation, and protein refolding. What drives HSP70 to do so many functions is molecular guide, the J-domain protein, which is presented during the HSP70 cycle and is uh, responsible for substrate binding, transferring it into HSP70, and stimulating the ATP hydrolysis, which is needed to trap the substrate. Also, there is the nucleotide exchange factor needed to recycle HSP70 to do another cycle. J-domain proteins can be divided into classes, and we can distinguish two main classes as class A and class B, which are from structural point of view pretty similar with differences in GF region, which is longer in class B, and also there is the zinc binding motif in class A. So knowing that there is the differences between J-domain proteins and there are uh, differences in aggregate substrate, I ask the question if there is the possibility of specialization between, between J-domain proteins and aggregated substrate. To investigate, I use the biolayer interferometry method, which is uh, about loading the substrate to 
um, to sensor, and then I can uh, check the interaction of chaperon proteins with this substrate. We also de developed the pretty new method of loading the amyloid fibrils into BLI sensor. When we start from monomeric form of beta peptide and after incubation, we obtain fibrils that can be loaded into sensor. So going into results, uh, we used the mm, human cytosolic chaperons. From class A, it was DNA a 2 and from class B, it was DNA b one And here you see the biolayer interferometry measurement to amyloid fibril. And you can see that in class B, there is the mm, uh, advantage on binding with uh, class, class B to amyloid fibril. So it means that uh, class B chaperons uh, has better ability to load the chaperone system into amyloid. To control that, we did the experiment with amorphous aggregate, and there is no difference uh, uh, seen between both classes. And it is easily seen when we compare both results together. So knowing that there is the difference uh, in white type proteins, we asked the question if we can see this during the evolution. So we did ancestral reconstruction to resurrect the common ancestor of class B protein, and both classes, the ancestor AB. So then having the sequences of our molecular dinosaurs, we wanted to know if they are functional. So we did, so we did the in vivo experiment in Saccharomyces cerevisiae because there is the homologous class B protein cis1 in yeast and it's uh, essential to, for growth. The deletion is lethal, but you can compensate this deletion by adding the extra copy of uh, this protein on plasmid. So having such a strain is a great tool to check the functionality of different proteins. So we did it to for ancestor protein, and when you compare the result from Y type and ancestor B, there is no difference between uh, compensation. So it means that our predicted proteins, protein works as well as uh, Y type protein. When you see the ancestor AB, which is more distant in evolutionary tree, you can see the compensation is uh, partially, so it means mm, there is only some features of class B in this ancestor. So then we did the same experiment with the same setup of BLI with ancestor. And what interesting is that we say the same pattern of binding in case of amyloid aggregate. So uh, to amyloid aggregate, the ancestor AB has better ability to load the whole chaperon system into, into aggregate. Uh, with amorphous aggregate, the situation is vice versa, uh, but what, what's the most important is here that ancestor B has the same ability as Y type B class protein. So in conclusion, to, to, to sum up the whole research and conclusions, uh, I can say that class B J domain proteins specialized into loading the amyloid, to, uh, specialized in loading the chaperon system into amyloid aggregate, and this, po and this poses the possibility that uh, class B J domain proteins can be related in uh, preventing the neurodegenerative diseases as Alzheimer disease. So thank you all to, uh, for attention and thank you all to my coworkers. And if you have any questions, I invite you to discussion. Thank you, nice presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, so maybe I, I wonder if your research have uh, has any milestone, something the most important. Most important. Mm. The most important, I think, uh, think there is that uh, we see the specialization specialization uh, in white type proteins and also in ancestral proteins. So now we can mm, distinct. We can observe the differences between both ancestors and compare uh, ancestors to white type proteins and somehow uh, check what differences between these proteins uh, specialize the white type protein to do this unique function of loading the chaperone system into amyloid, I think. It, it is the most important here, and it will be also the, mm, the next research that we want to do. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Now is the time for presentation by Jacek Sobczak from the Laboratory of Protein Biochemistry.
you can start. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me for my today's uh, master's degree project presentation. Uh, the title is The Role of HSP90 Chaperone in Protein Refolding from Aggregate. I realized my work in a laboratory of protein biochemistry under supervision of Dr. Agnieszka Kwasowska and Professor Krzysztof Liberek. Uh, I'd like to start with the protein folding and aggregation. As you know, proteins are being synthesized as a polypeptide chain on the ribosome, and sometimes from this step, they need to be assisted with the chaperone proteins, which guide them through the folding intermediates until uh, the protein achieves the uh, native state. Sometimes during this folding pathway, uh, it may happen that the protein may become misfolded and even more aggregated then. Uh, to reverse and to prevent such situation, the cells created a defensive system, uh, which consists of HSP40, 70, and 100 system, which can rescue the misfolded protein from the aggregate, and then with help of HSP70 and in final step HSP90 to refold it fully to the native state. As I mentioned, the both system may cooperate in yeast, the misfolded protein, is first defined by the HSP70 system, which consists of two elements, HSP40, which is in yeast YDJ, a class A J-domain protein, or class B J-domain protein, CIS1, and also from the HSP70 protein, which in yeast is SSA1. Uh, one. Uh, then, to the, the complex is being joined by the adaptory protein, uh, CI1, which allows for the handover of a substrate to HSP90 protein, which is HSP82 and HSP82 in yeast. The activity of this uh, protein uh, allows for the final, uh, final folding of the protein to its native state. So the aim of my study is the analysis of the role of HSP82 and HSC82 in the folding of proteins from aggregate. Uh, I started with the expression of both of the uh, yeast paralogs in uh, Escherichia competent uh, cells. Then, I lysed the cells with the French press, purified the protein on a NE NTA resin, and then there was a protease digestion, separation of byproducts of digestion, and the last step was the purification with the gel filtration. As you can see, the uh, protein was present in a, a cell lysed as way as well in a supernatant after centrifugation. Then the supernatant was loaded on the NE NTA uh, resin and eluted with a raising gradient of imidazole. Uh, the next step was a sumotac protein purification. In this case, we have protein with a sumotac and incubation with the ULP1 or sumoprotease allows to separate the tag and the protein and then to uh, pure, then the next step is the purification with a use of an NE NTA resin, which allows us to obtain the on, uh, only the protein, which then was loaded on a, a gel filtration. And here we can see the final product. So as I managed to obtain a, a, a purified proteins, I want to check their uh, activity in denaturated luciferase refolding by HSP70 system and HSP90 system. In this case, we have a class B Jane domain protein involved, a CIS1. As you can see, the HSP70 system, yes, HSP70 system consisting of SSA1 and CIS1, is able to restore uh, luciferase uh, activity, whereas the HSP90 system alone is not able to do that. In combination of both systems, we receive the highest luciferase reactivation for both of the uh, yeast uh, HSP90 paralogs. Uh, but in case when there is a class A of J domain protein involved, a YDJ1, uh, we don't see a stimulatory effect of HSP90 system in combination with HSP70 system as it was uh, uh, seen for the class B uh, J protein. To analyze the complex formation on the uh, aggregates of luciferase, I performed a biolayer inflammatory based analysis of firstly the binding of the HSP90 system to luciferase aggregate. So luciferase was aggregated on the sensor, then the HSP90 system was added. In this case, it was HSP82 and CI1 protein. As you can see, we observed barely any binding. But in case when there is a pre incubation with HSP70 system, with class B J domain protein, we see the binding of HSP90 system. Uh, the 
result of a same incubation, but with class A J domain protein, uh, he uh, gives us a uh, no binding result of class uh, of HSP19 system to the uh, complex. Uh, conclusions from my work are that there are no uh, significant differences between work of the parallax, ACE parallax, the HSP, oh, sorry, <laughs> the HSP90 protein uh, needs the adaptory protein and HSP70 system to efficiently reactivate luciferase and yes, HSP90 binds to protein aggregates through HSP70 system when class B, J domain, the uh, protein del delivers the HSP70 to aggregates and such binding is not observed in case of the class A J domain protein. Thank you. Thank you very much, great presentation. Uh, have you got any question? Do we have? Uh, so, my question is, class B J proteins have a EVD binding site, which is a C-terminal of HSP70 and also HSP90. So, do you think uh, your result is dependent on this C-terminal EVD peptide and how would you maybe verify this hypothesis? Uh, I think that it's uh, possible that it's uh, like a uh, competition between uh, those motifs for the uh, protein, I would find it to, I would find it by the like uh, immobilization of the one of the proteins on the sensor and then adding the, the, these two and to see the kinetics of the binding. Okay, next question. Okay, so I have, uh, how uh, can these uh, results contribute to uh, existing knowledge in your field? Uh, we know that HSP90 uh, protein is like helping the refolding of the proteins, but uh, we don't know actually the like the mechanism which mm -hmm. is between the whole process. So as you can see, we uh, analyze those uh, dependence of J domain proteins or uh, on uh, aggregate uh, the on the protein disaggregation. So I think as it is known that the, this protein is able to uh, help the refolding, but now we know more maybe how the uh, class of uh, J protein domain uh, influence the disaggregation or refoldings in this case. Okay, thank you for the answer, thank you. Our next speaker is Eva Gapinska from the Laboratory of Biopolymer Structure. Hello everyone, my name is Eva Gapinska and my master thesis is analysis of three monthly classes, a set of protein markers of OSIP develop developmental potential. My supervisors are Stanislav Ołdzie and Ines Nuk. So infertility is a common um, problem nowadays, but there are methods of treatment. One of them is in vitro fertilization. First step of this procedure is hormone therapy to start process of ovocyt maturation. Then the mature eggs are collected during ovarian puncture. Uh, they are randomly selected. There are no methods of ovocyt qualification to fertilization. In parallel, sperm is collected and the fertilization is performed. Obtained uh, embryos are grown on special media and they are observed if they develop properly. Uh, when they achieve blastocyst stage, they are genetically tested if they have a um, genetic dysfunction. If not, they are uh, able to transfer to women's uterus or to uh, preservation. This treatment can be used in case of fallopian tube damage or blockage. Uh, also due to low ovarian reserve 
an indicator of such a state is low level of anti-Mullerian hormone. Another reason to undertake this treatment are endometriosis, impaired sperm production or function, pregnancy disorders, and unexplained infertility. Aim of my project is to find the protein markers of OSIT development potential, which could be later used to qualify OSIT to the fertilization during IVF procedure. That could increase um, rate of successful procedures, and also that could decrease social concern connected with this procedure because less uh, zygotes would be produced during this procedure. Material to my analysis is human follicular fluid. It fills the cavity of ovarian follicle. My sample comes from in vitro clinic from the patient with low ovarian reserve, so they had low level of anti-mullerian hormone. I examined 30 samples. Control group were healthy excess donor in optimal age to reproduction. It was a group of 19 samples. Here is a table which shows to what stage all sites from my examined follicular fluid developed. 10 of them didn't undergo a process of fertilization. Eight of them started the division but stopped at the stage of few cells blastomers. 12 of them achieved blastocyst stage, but one stopped in the development. So to the transfer to the uterus or cryopreservation, only 11 embryos was available. First step in my methodology was filter IV sample preparation in which intact proteins were digested to peptide. Then the final cleanup was performed with usage of uh, stage tips procedure. The relative abundance was measured with usage uh, triple of mass spectrometer coupled with liquid chromatography column with usage of SWOT methodology. Each sample was prepared in free technical repetition. The proteins were identified based on <coughs> previously prepared uh, protein library. And thanks to the statistical analysis and uh, calculating the fault print, I could make uh, conclusions from my um, results. So uh, the relative abundance of 275 proteins was measured in my project. Uh, I observed that for the same patient in particular follicle, the number of uh, proteins with significant difference <coughs> of uh, in with significant difference in abundance in comparison to control group was different. As you can see here, it was 17, 6, and 10, and 3. That means the composition of follicular fluid is not dependent on overall woman's condition, but on functionality of particular follicle from which the fluid comes. During analysis of the results from mm, fluid from which uh, oocytes developed with blastocyst, I observed uh, in every sample significant change in clustering abundance in comparison to control group. It was downregulated, as you can see here. Also, complement C2 was significantly downregulated in comparison to control group. It was only in eight samples. The coffein one and uh, complement components C8 beta chains were significantly upregulated in comparison to control group. It was in seven and six samples respectively. In conclusions, my result shows that the follicular fluid is a proper material to search for protein markers of all seed development potential and that the clustering is a possible marker of all seed development potential. But to confirm this assumption, the study on a bigger scale are needed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, do you know uh, how was uh, the stage of OZ assessed? done in in vitro clinic. They firstly observe if there are two pronucleus in the zygote that confirms the fertilization process. Then they assess the number of blastomers. 
and at the end they assess the morphology of trophoblast and the embryo node. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions? Okay, no, so thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Philip Lewandowski from the Laboratory of Biopolymer Structure. and today I would like to uh, introduce you to the most important aspects of my uh, master project, which was the optimization of reduced capillary electrophoresis, sodium dodecyl sulfate for monoclonal antibody uh, analysis. <coughs> analysis. Uh, my supervisor is uh, Professor uh, Stanisław OJ from Laboratory of Biopolymer Structure. And as you could notice, I got this amazing opportunity to work in a cooperation with Paul Pharma Bio Biologics under the supervision of uh, Dominika Czornin. Uh, the main scope of Paul Pharma Biologic is to produce uh, recombinant monoclonal antibodies as the uh, biosimilar therapeutics. therapeutics. And uh, biosimilar itself, uh, they are the class of the biological uh, therapeutics which are similar in uh, terms of um, uh, of quality, safety, efficiency, and overall functionality to already uh, approved uh, reference biological product. And the development process involved uh, many steps, uh, starting with analytical and functional uh, studies, as well as non-clinical and well-designed um, clinical trials to uh, prove the uh, biosimilarity between these two uh, between those, these two antibodies. And uh, results from every single step needed to be uh, audited by uh, registration agencies such as uh, AMA in Europe or uh, FDA in United States. And the first stage of development, so uh, physical, uh, physical chemical characterization, is what we do in um, development and research group in Paul Pharma Biologics. And we need to uh, analyze every single significant uh, variants uh, and attributes of antibodies. And here are the examples of methods that are useful. And every single uh, one of them need to be uh, properly optimized to, uh, to be suitable to analyze uh, this particular antibody. And my task was to uh, optimize the capillary electrophoresis to determine the purity and uh, end glycosylation level, uh, which is the percentage of uh, fully functional uh, antibodies which contains oligosaccharides in their structure. And electro uh, ele mm. capillary electrophoresis itself uh, can be used to separate, uh, separate samples components based on their molecular weight. Using detergents such as SDS, uh, make the, uh, the proteins uh, denatured and also gain uh, negative charge. So thanks to that, when we apply high voltage in the system, then the uh, peptides can start to flow through the capillary. Uh, and the first one which uh, would reach the detector are the smallest one. So first we will see uh, small, um, small particles such as uh, light chain of antibodies and low molecular weight impurities. Next, they are followed by uh, heavy chains of antibodies, uh, then the uh, full monomers of antibodies, and we can sometimes observe uh, high molecular weight um, impurities at the end of electrophorograms. Uh, and my part was to uh, go one by one uh, through every single step of uh, procedure to finally obtain the results with uh, high uh, resolution and overall quality of the results. And starting with uh, sample preparation, the parameters that were optimized is the uh, final concentration of uh, antibody uh, to reach the uh, sensitive enough signals but without uh, overloading the capillaries. Uh, also the formulation of sample buffer, so choosing the proper salt and its um, concentration as well as percentage of SDS and uh, pH uh, of the solution. 
And the last uh, reagent uh, that was needed to uh, choose was the uh, reducing agent. In that case, it uh, was beta mercaptoethanol. Uh, and it's um, used to break all the disulfide bonds in the um, antibody structure. Next step was the incubation during which uh, denaturation and also a reduction reaction occurs. Uh, I've uh, checked uh, some combinations of, um, of temperature and time of the incubation. And as you can see, some of them uh, resulted in generating additional uh, peaks for uh, antibody fragments. Uh, so the one that, uh, that we chose was uh, the one without, <laughs> without them. And in, in that case, it was 70 degrees for 15 minutes. Uh, during performing all tests, uh, we noticed um, this behavior of, uh, of our samples that the longer uh, is the analysis, the less stable are the samples and the overall concentration of antibody in the sample was increasing in time, uh, probably by uh, evaporating of the uh, reagents from the samples. And to, um, let's say, inhibit this, um, uh, this behavior, um, I've chose to increase the total volume of samples from 100 micro microliters to 150 and also uh, I've tried to implement covering the surface of the, uh, of the sample with mineral oil to prevent from evaporating. And turned out that uh, in that case, samples are stable even for 24 hours uh, in sample garage in the, uh, in the apparat. Uh, and the last part was to, um, was to optimize sample separation um, conditions. Here I, uh, I was checking the temperatures of uh, capillary during the analysis and uh, used voltage. Uh, turned out that the best one was uh, 25 degrees with 12 kilovolts. Uh, in some cases, uh, the resolution was lower or not uh, all peaks were visible in the migration time window. Uh, and thanks to that, uh, I was able to optimize the method enough to um, to determine all the uh, necessary components of the, uh, of the samples, which is a uh, low um, light chain of uh, antibody, as well as heavy chain and non-glycosylated heavy chain, which is necessary to calculate the ratio between these two to, uh, to calculate the uh, N-glycosylation level uh, of antibodies in the samples. And the last part was, let's say, more innovative one. Uh, so I was trying to check if adding uh, other detergents, not just SDS, uh, to the gel buffer, which is used to fill the capillary, so it's, uh, it works as a matrix of the separation during the analysis. I was trying to, um, to use detergents with longer uh, hydrocarbon tails, such as uh, sodium tetradecyl sulfate and sodium hexadecyl sulfate. And as you can see, uh, the resolution uh, improved uh, a lot and the overall quality of the, uh, of the separation was, was uh, higher. Uh, this part of, uh, of experiments are not uh, fully finished right now, but my final goal, final goal is to develop completely new uh, final gel um, formulation, which would lead us to much better uh, quality of the separation. And thank you for your attention. If you've got any questions, I will be glad to answer them. Thank you very much. Great talk. Uh, we can start discussion. Do you have any questions? Okay, so this seems like something that had to be um, revised and uh, something that had to be um, had to have a lot of repetitions. Uh, I wonder how many repetitions did you need to achieve your final results? Oh, like you mean how many analyses? How many analyse, analyses? Yeah, yeah. So actually, I never counted them, but there were many of them. For example, if uh, just in case of, uh, of choosing the sample buffer, uh, when I use only trees, but I checked three different uh, concentrations, uh, two percentages of SDS and three different uh, pH, uh, so for this, it's like uh, 18 analyses just to choose the uh, proper, uh, proper sample buffer. Uh, when I was uh, checking the uh, separation uh, conditions, uh, I checked three temperatures and four voltages. So it's like 
12 analyses and I needed to perform every single one by one. So overall, it was like many of them. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next question. Okay, so I have a question about uh, gel formulation. So you added SDS and, uh, sorry, STS and SHS, and you added different concentration of this uh, detergents, why? Uh, yes, right, so the uh, default uh, gel with SDS, um, it got like 0.2% of SDS, so I wanted to uh, add the same amount of SDS and uh, SHS, but uh, as you know, the longer the uh, hydrocarbon tail, the lower the solubility um, of, the, uh, of the reagent. And it was just, uh, it, it wasn't possible to add so much of uh, SAS, uh, SHS to the, to the gel, so it would be completely dissolved in the solution. Uh, even in that case, I needed to use um, ultrasound chamber to somehow dissolve this uh, reagent and only that's why I just wasn't, uh, wasn't able to dissolve as much as SDS. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, I have one. It can be a kind of naive question, but I try. Um, can your method be transferred to other kinds of uh, antibodies like polyclonal or others? Actually, uh, like the, um, some of the parameters that I was checking uh, were based on the uh, previous uh, methods that were already used in the, in the Paul Pharma Biologics. Uh, but uh, as I said uh, on this slide, like every single method needs to be exclusively optimized. Okay. So like the basics can be transferred, but the final parameters needed to be checked and optimized for every single particular antibody. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so, yeah. Uh, hello everyone and welcome to my presentation that will be concerning peptidome composition of human saliva. My name is Konrad Stankiewicz and uh, my mentors were Professor Stanislav Oji and Magister Michał Puchalski. And I would like to start with uh, salivary gland tumors. They are have a heterogeneous group of glioplasm that present challenges and require invasive methods for proper diagnosis. My study highlights the urgent need for more modern approach to diagnostic, focusing uh, specifically on saliva as a potential easy and non-invasive source for early tumorogenesis markers. I've used advanced molecular and proteomic approaches to build um, a comprehensive peptidomic uh, library that will help in the future um, validation and identification of potential biomarkers. Previously, uh, mass spectrometry-based uh, analysis had been performed um, to determine uh, the chemical composition, the peptidome composition of human saliva. Uh, but as I've said, uh, or maybe I did not, the complexity of human saliva makes it extremely hard uh, for mass spectrometers to um, give us uh, best yield, um, meaning most hit when it comes to peptides. Uh, that means uh, that the mm, sensitivity of this approach is pretty low. And that led us to test uh, whether applying um, a comprehensive prefractionation strategy would help us to get uh, more uh, pronounced results. But before prefractionation stage can begin, there needs to be a purifying one. Because saliva is composed of many different fractions of many different substances, most of them considered to be unwanted. Um, so we need to purify our sample, for example, by using solid phase extraction method to make sure that we get one uh, pure peptide fraction containing thousands of thousands of peptides. This is what's called a pool uh, sample. Then we can apply prefractionation and make sure that this one pure peptide sample 
is later uh, divided into many smaller samples, but each one containing much smaller number of proteins, uh, peptides. Uh, then it's so much easier for mass spectrometry based analysis to um, better identify and detect uh, proteins and peptides within it. And only after we get all of the results from every different uh, sample, uh, we can put them all together and incorporate them into one comprehensive peptidomic uh, library. So the general prefractionation method itself, uh, the focus of our study. Uh, we have used uh, high-performance liquid chromatography in a gradient of two buffers, A and B, which chemical composition uh, differs depending on the type of column that was used. Uh, I used three columns, and these were uh, high pH column, protease 18 and strong exchange, uh, strong cation exchange. And they were working respectively in high, neutral, and low pH environments. The literature usually suggests that high pH column is usually the one that uh, gets us the best results. Uh, so it came as quite of a surprise when the high pH uh, column came only just close second with 2,076 uh, distinct peptides identified. Actually, protease 18 column uh, was the one that uh, yielded over 200 distinct peptides more. And as you can see, strong cation exchange column behaved underwhelmingly. So putting it all together, we have uh, so far identified 3,520 distinct peptides only by using this new prefractionation method. Seems like quite a number, but doesn't say much if we do not compare it to our previous findings. And as you can see, I was quite successful uh, in being able to identify more peptides by uh, applying this new uh, prefractionation method. And I was, well, um, successful by over 1,000 uh, distinct peptides. So if we now put all of the results together, the previous ones and the new ones, we get a total number of 4,665 distinct peptides identified, with each one having a potential to revolutionize the way that we look at the diagnostics of human salivary glands tumors. And on that hopeful note, I would like to leave you and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? No, no, okay. Uh, so maybe I, I try. Um, I wonder what was the most challenging um, part of your studies? Can you repeat one more time? What was the most challenging um, step of your studies? Uh, the repetitions. Uh, so. <laughs> Well, it was quite challenging to withstand uh, me uh, performing chromatography over and over uh, just to get the same kind of mm, underwhelming results mm, time and time again. So yeah, the repetitions. Okay, thank you. Speaker is Konrad Kantas uh, from the Laboratory of Biophysics. Good morning. My name is Konrad Kantas. I'm doing my master thesis in the Laboratory of Biophysics. My supervisor is Professor Jacek Kiosic, and the title of my presentation is Ida Rubicin, Platinum Nanoparticles, Interactions, and Their Possible Biological Influence. In 2020, over 90 million new cancer cases occurred. This number is being prognosed to grow up to 50% in 2040. At the same time, today, almost 60% of cancer cases are still treated with different chemotherapeutics. One of them is idarubicin. It's a second generation anthracycline uh, used in the treatment of leukemias in adults. It can cause plenty of side effects with the most dangerous one, the 
cardiotoxicity. In the structure of idarobicin, we can distinguish three parts. The part one is responsible for the um, intercalation of idarobicin to DNA. Part two uh, shows uh, the or gives the idarobicin the inhibitory um, properties towards topoisomerase two. And the third part stabilizes the structure of idarobicin uh, DNA complex. In my work, I'm using 30 nanometer diameter platinum nanoparticles. However, as a group, and they are used today in the, for example, cell imaging, phototermal therapy, drug delivery, thanks to their antimicrobial, antioxidant, and anti-cancer properties. For my methodology, I used spectrofluorimetry, which allows me to measure the relative fluorescence of idarobicin. I did uh, the dynamic light uh, scattering analysis, where I measured the hydrodynamic diameter of my platinum nanoparticles, and I performed three series of AMES tests, which are the mutagenic uh, tests. And in all of them, I was using Salmonella cecumurium TA98 bacterial strain. And in series one, I used idarobicin as the mutagenic agent. In series two, I used the platinum nanoparticles. And uh, last, I did, um, I mixed them together uh, to measure the potential modulation of activity. My thesis can be divided into two parts. Uh, the first one, uh, the idarobicin interacts with platinum nanoparticles. And the second part, those interactions have biological, uh, have influence on their biological activity. The results of uh, dynamic light scattering show the addition of small amount of idarobicin to the platinum nanoparticles causes the disruption in the hydrodynamic diameter of, um, of platinum nanoparticles in the solution and the higher amount of idarobicin causes the aggregation, uh, which is seen here as the shift of the curve. Uh, so we can tell that with the dynamic light scattering, uh, I found the interactions between idarobicin and platinum nanoparticles occur. Uh, it was later uh, seen in the spectrofluorimetry. As you can see, when I measured uh, the relative fluorescence of idarobicin, uh, the red line shows the initial uh, fluorescence and the blue line shows the final signal of idarobicin. The titration with, uh, when we compare the titration with uh, platinum nanoparticles, we can see the significant difference uh, in the signal drop between the control group with uh, sodium citrate and uh, the measurement with addition of platinum, platinum nanoparticles. Those, uh, this result means that those interactions occur. Uh, the, later, I did the AIMS test with um, platinum nanoparticles and it showed that uh, the platinum nanoparticles itself has also uh, almost uh, non-mutagenic or non, actually, non-mutagenic activity. Uh, later, I did the test with idarobicin. Uh, here, um, I found out that the most optimal amount of the drug is 1,000 and 2,000 nanograms per plate. With the higher concentrations, I observed the cytotoxic effect of the drug on the bacteria. And uh, later, I did the test with 2,000 nanograms uh, of idarobicin uh, per plate mixed with the different um, amount of platinum nanoparticles. And I observed that there might be uh, the modulation of um, idarobicin ac uh, activity by the platinum nanoparticles. In the conclusion, uh, I can tell that platinum nanoparticles interact with idarobicin. Those interactions depend on the concentration of platinum nanoparticles. And also I observed that uh, the obtained results um, 
show the possible biological effect. However, uh, more additional tests uh, needs to be conducted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, it's time for discussion. Do we have any question? I see one. Um, so I wonder, uh, you were talking about this uh, cytotoxic effect of either rubicin and do, is it known if uh, how this uh, cytotoxic effect occurs? Uh, I found a study uh, which shows that the cytotoxic effect might be caused by the, accu uh, the accumulation of idarubicin uh, causes the induction of reactin reactive oxygen species in the cell, which as a result uh, can be observed um, as the um, cytotoxic effect on the cell. So okay. the reactive oxygen species which are harm harmful cause the cytotoxic effect. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, do you think that the uh, effect induced by these reactive oxygen species can be mediated by the properties of the platinum nanoparticles? Because you mentioned that they have antioxidative properties. Uh, I found a study uh, wi where which showed that um, the cell cultures treated, um, so scientists measured uh, the amount of reactive oxygen species uh, in the um, cell cultures and the addition of, um, the addition of platinum nanoparticles into cell culture resulted in the significantly lower amount of uh, reactive oxygen species. So there it is confirmed that their presence uh, lowers the the amount of uh, reactive oxygen species, yes. Okay, other questions? So I have one. Uh, could you describe uh, more in more details um, AIMS test, how it looks like, AIMS? The AIMS test? Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, a bacterial strain uh, which is unable to grow uh, without the external uh, addition of uh, histidine. And this strain, uh, I'm using the mutagenic agent on this strain, uh, which causes the mutation. Uh, th those mutation allows uh, the bacteria to grow on the media without histidine. And thanks to that, I, I, can, by the, I can count the amount of um, bacteria colony is present on the plate and thanks to that I can uh, measure the relative uh, mutagenic activity of the of the agent I am using. Okay, so it's like revertance. And uh, the last uh, presentation uh, in this panel, uh, it's uh, by Anna Kowalczyk from the Laboratory of Physical Biochemistry. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anna Kowalczyk, and today I would like to show you the presentation called Development and Validation of a Method Indicating Stability of Carbocystein in Gastrointestinal, and, uh, gastro gastrointestinal Tracts and Liver Condition. The project was supervised by Dr. Leszek Kaczyński from Laboratory of Physical Biochemistry. So let me start with a quick introduction. What carbocystein actually is? It is an organic compound which delivered from uh, amino acid cysteine. It is used in a medicine as a muca active agent, uh, which normalizes the composition of mucus and reduces its viscosity. And it is used for treatment of several respiratory tract disorders, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and asthma. Uh, under acidic pH and thermal stress conditions, carbocystein can be converted uh, into lactam. Uh, currently available uh, methods for uh, studying carbocystein content, as well as its related substances, 
described by European Pharmacopoeia is, uh, is limited to thin layer chromatography. Therefore, the aim of the study was to develop and validate a more automated and more efficient method to uh, study these two compounds. And the choice was to use uh, high pressure liquid chromatography, HPLC. This method was uh, needed to later on be able to investigate uh, an impact of the conditions in gastrointestinal tract and liver on carpet stain stability. The method development process consisted of three main stages. Uh, at the beginning, mobile and stationary phases needed to be uh, select. A stationary phase had to have an ability to interact both with carpet stain and carpet stain uh, lactam uh, and uh, to allow their separation. Uh, we chose highly, uh, mm, highly uh, specialized column, uh, silica-based column with uh, amide packing. And uh, elution of these compounds from this specific column required a high concentration of organic solvent in mobile phase. The choice was to use acetonitrile with uh, addition of ammonium acetate buffer. And such high concentration of acetonitrile uh, was a challenge uh, because it can cause uh, a precipitation of salts from buffers used as uh, solvents during the analysis. To overcome the problem and also to obtain the results that we uh, expected, uh, we uh, used method uh, optimization. Design of experiment method methodology was uh, used to build a mathematical model of experiment. Uh, subsequently, model was statistically uh, tested with ANOVA test, uh, and uh, it allowed us to confirm significance of the whole model, as well as to point the factors and parameters that had the greatest influence on the uh, responses we wanted to obtain. Here you can see a three-dimensional visualization of how different parameters, in this case column temperature and acetonitrile percentage in mobile phase, can influence the uh, responses we're obtaining. And in this case, uh, uh, retention time of carpet stain is examined. Uh, the optimized uh, conditions of the method uh, were later on validated to see if the method would produce reliable uh, results. And it was validated for all the method listed here on the slide. And finally, after optimization and after validation, uh, we obtained uh, HPLC method conditions. Uh, here you can see all of them. Uh, and I only want to mention that as a detector, we used a spectrophotometer and all the measurements were taken at 210 nanometers. So using this uh, method, we were able to assess the effect of different conditions in gastrointestinal uh, tract and uh, liver on carpet stain uh, stability. In the first experiment, carpet stain was incubated in various pHs uh, and uh, the, the pHs were uh, within the uh, range of pHs that uh, can be found in digestive system, so between 2 and 8. Uh, as you can see, uh, we observed the lactamization in a, a whole tested range of pHs, uh, but as expected, the uh, rate of this process was the highest in low pH, in pH around 2, and in the pHs near neutral, the process still occurs, but uh, the rate of this process is lower. In the next experiment, carpet stain was incubated uh, at 37 Celsius degrees, uh, and this time pH of the carpet stain solution was changed during the incubation in a manner that corresponds to gastrointestinal tract uh, conditions. And uh, we observed very similar tendency as before. Uh, so uh, in the conditions resembling stomach conditions where pH is uh, low, we observed the uh, high uh, rate of lactamization process. And uh, moving on to conditions uh, of duodenum and small intestine where pH uh, is growing, uh, we observe that uh, process still occurs, but it's st it is slowing down. One last experiment that we were able to conduct was, an, uh, was to assess the effect of liver enzymes activity uh, on uh, carpet stain stability. Uh, and this time carpet stain was incubated with liver extract uh, and again, we were able to observe lactamization process. Uh, it suggests that uh, 
maybe not only uh, chemical conditions uh, of environment such as pH, but also uh, activity of different enzymes in digestive system can uh, influence uh, the lactamization process. So to conclude, we are able to successfully develop uh, HPLC method for carbocystein and lactam uh, studies. And uh, we confirmed that carbocystein may be converted to lactam in the whole uh, range of the conditions uh, present in digestive system, but the rate of this uh, process may differ. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, I have one question. Uh, I wonder if when the, they are converted to lactams, are, uh, are they somehow become toxic for humans or like mutagenic? Uh, yes, uh, the pros uh, sorry, uh, the studies of toxicology of lactam, which I am familiar with, uh, claims that uh, lactam is not toxic, but the problem is that uh, lactam is being produced in a product, pharmaceutical product with carbocystein. So uh, when carbocystein is converted to lactam, there is a lower concentration of carbocystein in this product, so this is a problem. But what we wanted to suggest with this study is that maybe uh, lactam is not so much of an impurity, but maybe it's just a neutral product from carbocystein and maybe the, uh, maybe the function is similar to carbocystein, but it, it of course, uh, we require uh, further research. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, I have one. Um, if you have additional time uh, during your master project, what would you do? Uh, so I think that this uh, last experiment with uh, activity of enzymes uh, still needs to be uh, uh, researched because uh, we still don't know uh, which enzymes can uh, influence this process and uh, how they influence it, in which way. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the topic which needs uh, further research. Thank you very much. <laughs> and congratulations for all the students for good preparation. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, for listening and for nice questions. And now I uh, move the discussion uh, to the coffee break.
Oh, hello, hello. Hello, hello everyone. I would like to welcome you on after the coffee break on the second panel of today's presentations. And this panel is concerning plants and uh, microorganisms mainly. And the first presenter is uh, Victoria Korczakov. Floor is yours. Hello everybody, my name is Victoria Korczakov and today I will be presenting the uh, results of my master thesis analysis and the topic of my master thesis is effect of overexpression of the gene encoding phospholipid diacylglycerol acyltransferase, in short uh, PIAT, on the content of lipids, uh, fats and the sugars in Arabidopsis thaliana plant. Uh, this analysis was performed in a laboratory of plant biochemistry. Uh, moving on. I guess it's not working. Um. Okay, yeah, now it's working. Moving on to the quick introduction. Um, in my uh, studies, I was using a Robidopsis thaliana plant, which is a model plant, uh, which is widely used in laboratories uh, because of uh, its uh, small sizes and short life cycle, which allows to grow it in uh, laboratory conditions. Uh, I was growing uh, Arabidopsis thaliana plants and using rosettes, stems, and uh, also the seeds of the um, plant. And uh, my uh, study was focusing on uh, PDAT uh, uh, enzyme, and uh, it is involved in uh, acyl-CoA independent uh, biosynthesis of SAX uh, pathway. And uh, in the early 2000s, it was uh, discovered that uh, there is an alternative pathway for TAC biosynthesis, which is uh, connected to PDAT. That's why we are studying it. Uh, the aims of the study is to um, find out how this overexpression uh, influences the plant development, sugar content, protein content, and also lipid content and composition. Uh, I was using, as a materials, I was using the um, plants on two uh, stages of growth. On the picture A, you see the plant on uh, the stage of uh, zero days after flowering. Uh, and for this analysis, I was using the whole rosettes uh, to analyze it. And uh, on picture B, you can see the uh, older plants. And for this, to analyze it, I was using uh, rosettes, stems, and seeds separately. And for my experiments, I was using the wild type line uh, and uh, also the two overexpression line, lines. Um, the methods which were used in these uh, studies uh, um, 
uh, presented here and to study protein content, I was uh, performing BCA protein assay and also gel electrophoresis. Uh, to study sugar content, I uh, performed colorimetric analysis using GAPOT reagent and uh, measurement with on uh, spectrophotometer and uh, then I calculated the contents of sugars in, pro in uh, plants. To study lipid uh, content and composition, the gas, spectro uh, gas uh, chromatography was performed. Uh, here you can see uh, the results section and starting with the plant development on panel A you can see the weight of the whole plants and uh, on panel B you see the weight of rosettes and on panel C you see the weight of stems. Uh, here we can see the big differences between the growth of the plants except the fact that the weight of rosettes for wild type is a lot higher than the overexpressors but it can be uh, explained due to the fact the wild type was grown in time a little bit longer than the overexpressors because they achieved the zero dust stage uh, later in time. Uh, here we can see the uh, graphs which represent the glucose content and also the starch content in uh, leaves uh, at stage zero DAF, 12 DAF and stems. Here we can see that the results for overexpressor 2 in stems uh, for glucose is a lot higher than nearly two times than, uh, in comparison to wild type. And also the results for overexpressor uh, of starch content is a lot higher uh, in uh, 12 DAF uh, plants and also the stems. Moving on to the protein analysis, here uh, the experiment was performed for the leaves at stage 0 DAF, 12 DAF stems and also the seeds separately. And here we can see the for seeds, which you see on the right, uh, the uh, protein content uh, was uh, a lot higher for the overexpressors than uh, in uh, wild type. And also uh, in, uh, for overexpressors uh, expressor 2 uh, in leaves at stage 0 DAF and also in stems and for overexpressor 1 in uh, leaves at 12 DAF stage. Uh, here you can see the also gel electrophoresis analysis and in frame you can see the protein profile for leaves and, that, and it shows that it's similar ev even for 0 DAF and 12 DAF seeds but also um, uh, uh, leaves, I'm sorry, and for seeds and stems it's uh, a little bit different. So this represents that uh, for different organs the protein profile is different. Uh, here we can see the lipid content analysis and uh, the table A represents uh, uh, the mole uh, percentage of individual, individual fatty acids in uh, zero DAF plants and uh, table B represents the mole of individual fatty acids in 12 DAF uh, plants. Here we can see that uh, mm, the composition of lipids uh, doesn't differ too much except of the fact that for overexpressors for example, the uh, mm, mm, last uh, part of the table, uh, the linoleic acid is a uh, higher uh, am amount of uh, uh, it in overexpressor lines and same in uh, table B. Uh, so for the conclusions, uh, as I, told, uh, as I to told you uh, before, uh, the growth doesn't differ in uh, tested lines that, uh, too much. Sugar content was uh, for, for glucose in uh, 12 DAF uh, leaves uh, even two times higher. And also the starch content was also increased in uh, overexpress lines. Uh, protein content also, sh uh, analysis for protein content also showed that the overexpression of feed gene influences the increased content of protein. And the lipid composition analysis uh, showed as result uh, in higher amount of um, uh, some acid, but also the analysis of uh, lipid content is also in progress and uh, still has to be done. And uh, this is all from me. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any question, I'm free to ask you. Thank you, Victoria. And do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, so you showed us that you measured some differences in the substances uh, you uh, were testing, but have you noticed if uh, maybe there was some uh, change in the appearance of the uh, mutants you were using along with uh, the change in the substances? Like you mean uh, to the first results for the plant development one? Uh, I'm asking if the plants uh, looked differently. Looked differently? Uh, yes. 
yes, as I told on uh, the first results um, slide, uh, the overexpressed lines uh, achieved uh, the needed uh, growth stage uh, faster than the wild type, but the wild type was uh, um, growing for a little bit longer in time and uh, the leaves, for example, were a little bit uh, bigger uh, than the overexpressed one, but the overexpressed grew in time faster. Thank you for the answer. And do we have any second question? I don't see any, so thank you for the good questions. Thank you. So moving on to the second speaker, uh, I welcome uh, Elisabetta Ruzakovic to her presentation. Hello, uh, my name is Ruzakovic Elisabetta and uh, my master's research was performed at the Laboratory of Plant Biochemistry and the title is as follows. The impact of knockout and overexpression of genes encoding a tree are in the compatibility of enamines on the development of reproductive plants under salt stress conditions. Salt stress uh, is ever spreading problem. Uh, salt toxicity have a drastic impact on the plants, uh, resulting in uh, diminution of uh, cells and root growth, uh, and also problems with respiration and uh, photosynthesis. Uh, mutants at our laboratory are the ones with overexpression and knockouts of genes encoding acyl transferases. Uh, so, uh, what uh, purpose do they perform in uh, the plant? Uh, cell uses those acyl transferases to transport uh, fatty acids uh, from acyl coas to uh, lysophospholipids, uh, producing uh, phospholipids, uh, and for the reverse reaction in the Lenz cycle. Uh, the four producing different phospholipids, which perform wide range of functions from being uh, the main component of the cell membrane uh, to signaling particles. Uh, so, Overexpression, uh, overexpressor mutations of LPI genes result in bigger phenotype uh, of mutants and knockouts result in a uh, smaller phenotype. Uh, will it affect the way uh, plants respond to salt stress? Then if yes, what changes? What may be a reason for a uh, different uh, reaction for stressful conditions? To answer those questions, we will start with materials and methods. As you can see, uh, mutants are based on two genes, one named LPI1 and second LPI2. Uh, other than morphological observations was used such techniques as gas chromatography, enzyme assays, and uh, quantity of pigment was established through spectrophotometry measurements. And I would like to introduce you to our test subjects. Here you can see Arabidopsis taliana plants on the 39th day of growth and uh, 25 days of treatment with 150 millimole concentration of salt and with 300. As you can see, uh, salt uh, definitely diminished uh, plant growth, although not entirely in 150 millimole concentration. Uh, also, it is visible that uh, overexpressor plants remained bigger than wild type plants. Uh, this is concurred by uh, the rate of appearing of the first yellow leaf. Uh, you can see that uh, overexpressor mutants and even uh, first knockout resisted longer to stress conditions. Um, the first yellow leaf appeared later. Uh, and here is presented uh, dry mass of plants treated with 150 millimole uh, concentration and with 300. Uh, it is visible that uh, mass of overexpressors is higher than average mass of wild type plants. Although this difference tend to disappear in uh, higher concentrations of salt. Plants was tested also in in vitro conditions. Uh, and uh, here is presented dry mass of roots and rosette. Uh, interesting thing that uh, you can see is that uh, second overexpressor uh, on average has 30% uh, higher mass than its, uh, uh, than its plant in normal conditions. Uh, in 75 millimole, uh, we have one uh, uh, first uh, overexpressor that is uh, bigger compared to its control than other lines. Uh, it is not quite as similar with rosette mass, uh, but still we ha can see uh, mm, supremacy of uh, first uh, overexpressor compared to its control uh, uh, and uh, compared to other lines. Uh, at this figure, you can see uh, composition of fatty acids. 
uh, of WildApp uh, and uh, LP at one uh, over Expressor. Um, 63 content uh, is decreasing in uh, stress conditions uh, by 6%, 81 rises by 0.6% and 82 by 2 to 3 percent. Also, it does not result in uh, any differences between wild type and overexpressor plants. Activity of LPAT in uh, overexpressor plants under stress conditions is higher than uh, in wild type plants under stress, but is still significantly lower than in normal conditions. Uh, for LPCAT activity, overexpressor plants uh, manage to uh, maintain its level uh, on the similar uh, base, uh, when in wild type plants it drastically plummets. Uh, for PA, PA can be treated as indicator of stress, so no surprise that we see uh, much higher levels of uh, its synthesis in wild type plants under stress. Also, in overexpressor plants, uh, it's diminishing from initial high levels. Uh, quantity of pigments uh, is reduced uh, by overexpression mutation uh, in, even in normal conditions uh, and under stressful conditions uh, this problem becomes significant. As for conclusion, conclusions we can say that overall overexpressor mutants cope better with salt stress which cannot be said about knockout, uh, knockout plants. Uh, stress, salt stress changes a relative amount of 163, 181, and 82 fatty acids of uh, overexpressor plants, uh, although it does not uh, occur, uh, also its similar effect occurs in wild type plants. Uh, salt stress decreases the activity of LPAT and LPCAT, but increases LPAT activity in wild type, pla wild type plants. Uh, and uh, in uh, overexpressor plants, LPAT and LPAT activity decreases, uh, and LPCAT activity remains at the same level. Overexpression mutation decreases pigment content, cell stress only deepens this effect. Uh, thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, uh, you can ask them now. Thank you, Lisa, for this great presentation. And do we have any questions from the audience? Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned, but uh, okay. I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but uh, I was wondering why did you choose the salt stress, not any other uh, stressful conditions? Uh, to be honest, uh, salt stress is a very complex problem. Uh, it affects all uh, the cell, and uh, every mutation that somehow changes uh, metabolism of the cell is worth exploiting uh, at the angle of resistance to stressful conditions. Uh, included salt stress. And moving on to the another question. And why for the later part of your experiment did you choose this over expressor one? Uh, uh, because over it showed uh, higher resistance to salt stress, uh, so we decided uh, to explore it deeper uh, to uh, have some sort of uh, Got a word. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, which is identification of molecu molecular determinants of bacterial adhesion in Ochlobacterium antilopi. My supervisor is Professor Sylvia Yatra from the Laboratory of Plant Microbiology. Uh, so the Ochlobacterium genus are gram-negative aerobic bacteria uh, that although they occur mostly in soil, they also adapted to variety of other environments and some species can be animal pathogen while other can be plant symbionts. 
they are known to be resistant to antimicrobials, particularly from the beta-lactam group. And so the species that I choose for my research is Ochlobacrum antilope, that is human opportunistic pathogen. Uh, and uh, it is known to be able to colonize the me medical devices such as catheters or the prosthesis. Therefore, treatment of the, in the, of the infections uh, requires the devices removal. What is interesting, it can also colonize the plant surfaces. Uh, why is adhesion even important? Adhesion is crucial for the surface colonization and formation of a biofilm, which is very beneficial for bacteria uh, since it uh, protects it from environmental stresses, gives more resistance to xenobiotic and better nutrients availability. Some of the bacterial adhesion factors are flagellum and fili that allow movement towards the surface or the bacterial secretions such as cellulose or unipolar polysaccharide, uh, which uh, allow it to attach to the surface permanently. Uh, and so the aim of my work is to identify those genes related to bacterial adhesion in chlorobacrum anthropy, and I will use the transposome transpos mutagenesis method. Uh, so I use the PEGL555 plasmid that carries the transposome linear, and it inserts in the 80 regions in the genome. Uh, and since insert, it inserts in random spot, it gives uh, me vast of the mutants with uh, mutations in random genes that I can then further test to spot those that will be interesting to me. Uh, so before I managed to optimize the transposome mutagenesis method, I tested three different plasmids, but unfortunately, only one of them turned out to be efficient in this Ochlobacrum anthropy species. And so to spot the bacteria with uh, a mutation that affect adhesion, I did the biofilm formation test. So bacteria were grown overnight in 96 wells. Uh, then I measured the optical density, stained them with crystal violet, and uh, measured the absorbance of crystal violet that is bound to bacteria in biofilm, then divided by optical density. Uh, this is what this test looks like. So here we can compare the wild type of Robacrum anthropy uh, with one of the mutants with reduced uh, biofilm formation ability. And I did this test for three different media, two of which were uh, rich in nutrients and one minimal media. And I obtained mutants with both elevated and reduced biofilm formation ability. Uh, so here, is, here are my results. Uh, it's uh, the biofilm formation ability for each mutant in comparison to the wild, wild type. It's shown as percentage of biofilm for wild con control. And I did the same for the other two media. So here is the box plot in which I decided to compare the mutants with the lowest ability to form biofilm with those that were the best in bio forming biofilm also as percentage of the uh, wild type of Helobacterium. And uh, until now I've spotted 110 mutants uh, that formed uh, more of biofilm in at least one of the tested media and uh, 77 mutants with reduced biofilm formation ability. Uh, so we can see here also that the composition of the medium actually affected the biofilm formation ability in bacteria as well. Uh, then after I finish the screening, I will have to conduct the biofilm formation of plastic assay again, this time in more replicas to get more precise results. And then I will do the statistical analysis to see which mutants show significant difference to the wild type. So to sum up, uh, until now I managed to optimize my protocol for the transposome mutagenesis in Ochlobacrum anthropy. I obtained 400 of mutants and I just, uh, tested 300 of them and uh, I got mutants with both elevated and reduced biofilm formation ability, but I don't know yet which genes are responsible for it, so I need to do more tests and then send them to be sequenced. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Alexandra. Do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, so I would have a question for you. Uh, are there any differences between uh, tests for biofilm formation that you used for screening and for confirmations? Uh, the differences that here I did is actual replicas from uh, fully overnight cultures. While in the screening, I just used uh, free replicas because in the screening, I just wanted to spot mutants that may be different. Uh, we'll, while here, I need to get more precise results to do the statistical test and to see that the difference is indeed significant. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, hi everyone, my name is Alicia Adriańska and I was conducting my master thesis under supervision of PhD Anna Ignatovich in Laboratory of Plant Protection and Biotechnology. I focused my studies on characterization of Arabidopsis cDNA mutants and overexpression lines of the CAX4 gene encoding the metal transporter cultured under selected micronutrient deficiencies. We know that micronutrients deficiencies play a import, an important role in processes like photosynthesis or respiration and others. They are also cofactors for many essential enzymes. Uh, these processes are still not fully understood. Dr. Ignatovich's team conducted several projects on the study of uh, plant responses to micronutrients deficiencies, mainly iron and manganese. In one such uh, study, several candidating genes were identified, including CAX4, including, uh, CAX4 uh, gene. And next, uh, my role was to per conduct uh, functional characterization of Arabidopsis CAX4 gene. CAX4 is from cation exchanger. It's a vacuolar cation proton antiporter involved in, in, involved in root development under metal stress. It's a member of uh, multi-gene family. There are six CAX, uh, CAX genes, which are med mediating influx of cations into the, into the vacuole. And we know that CAX4 expression is significantly reduced under manganese deficiency. We also know that CAX4-1 mutant is have a bigger rosettes and higher leaf number and later flowering time than the white type when uh, it was grown under manganese deficiency and it was also conducted that manganese uh, deficiency is better tolerated by CAX41 mutant. I focused uh, on functional characterization on CAX4 gene using an independent line uh, CAX, uh, CAX42 together with CAX41 mutant and two overexpression lines and white type Columbia. In, in the study, following uh, material and methods were used. Plant material, as I mentioned before, two types of cultures, genotyping, biochemical and grow related traits, also statistical and in silico analysis. And in, in the next few slides, I'll show you results of growth related and biochemical traits. traits. And here we can see some, some trends. Uh, what's interesting, both mutants under iron deficiency have visibly lower fresh weight of rosettes than uh, the white type, but uh, in control conditions, zinc deficiency conditions and manganese deficiencies, those mutants have a slightly higher uh, fresh weight. The same trend we can observe for, for the root. In chlorophyll A content, we can uh, observe that under iron deficiency, uh, both mutants have a slightly higher uh, content of uh, chlorophyll A, 
the same uh, trend was observed for manganese, but uh, in the opposite to control condition. Similar trend we can observe in chlorophyll B content of Arabidopsis leaf. In uh, iron deficiency, we can see that uh, it was slightly higher uh, content, but for carotenoids content, it's difficult to see a clear trend, but what is clear here that under manganese uh, deficiency, all mutants have the highest uh, content of carotenoids. In flowering time, which was uh, recorded as a rosette leaf number, we can see that uh, both mutants have a slightly slight delay in flowering when compared to the wild type uh, plants. As a conclusion, we can say that CAX4 knockout mutants under zinc and manganese deficiency have higher rosettes uh, and roots uh, fresh weight compared to the wild type plants, but under iron deficiency, the fresh weight was uh, lower. And under iron deficiency, they have higher, have higher chlorophyll A and B content when compared to the wild type plants. And we also observe a small delay in flowering time when they were grown in soil. Overexpression lines show intermediate phenotype with re respect to most of the tested growth related and biochemical traits. All tested uh, plant genotype under zinc deficiency have the lowest uh, fresh, fresh weight of rosettes, but under manganese deficiency, on the other hand, they have the lowest fresh weight of roots. Under manganese deficiency, there was observed the highest content of carotenoids and under control conditions and iron deficiency conditions, we observed the, the lowest content of carotenoids. And as, uh, as to sum up uh, all information, we can uh, conduct that CAX4 plays an important role in growth and plant development under nutrients limited conditions, in particular under iron deficiency stress. And its exact role requires further investigation. I still have some works in progress like genotyping of the stalk CAX42 mutants and conducting stat statistical and in silico analysis. And from this place, I would like to thank uh, very much to my supervisor, PhD Anna Ignatowicz and PhD students Isabella Perkowska for their help. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Alicia. And I see one question from the audience, and the second, and the third, and the fourth, actually. Very interesting presentation, I guess. Hi, why do, did you use uh, two, I'm sorry, uh, two DNA uh, mutants? Uh, I used two DNA mutants because previously, uh, experiments were conducted only on one CAX uh, for one mutant, but uh, to obtain a reliable genetic profiling, it was necessary to repeat those analyses on, on the independent, uh, in my case, CAX for two mutant. Thank you for the answer and the second question. Okay, we have even more now. <laughs> Uh, so I wonder how the uh, flowering time was uh, related to the uh, rosette leaf number. Thank you. It's correlated this way that uh, if you have more leaves, the later is flowering time, as you can see on this uh, uh, slide. And it's correlated with the release of the first, uh, it's called bolting. Thank you. Another question. Uh, so I have a question about the carotenoid content because you are yeah. talking about the, like you have, um, there are some plants which have a high carotenoid content, some other that have lower carotenoid content. I have a question. What kind, uh, what doesn't have like the, uh, not the purpose, but the effect on the plant, like the content of these carotenoids? Uh, this content of carotenoids helps plants to cope with the uh, stress uh, which they 
like harder here. Okay, thank you so much. Do you have another questions? If not, then thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Pathogens, which cause degradation of plant cell walls, uh, mainly their pectinolytic enzymes. Two of the groups which are of biggest interest to us are DK and Pectobacterium species, and they've listed here some of them which are, I think, most relevant to uh, concerns we are uh, having or studying. And those are the diseases of soft throat and black leg. And I focus here on potatoes, but those diseases uh, affect um, other crops as well as many other plants, ornamental plants. And this problem uh, causes quite a severe economic losses across, uh, well, I s s focus here on Europe and, and potatoes, but if you also include other plants and uh, all of the world, the uh, numbers are very high and uh, quite uh, worrying. And the problem exists largely due to the fact that we don't really have a good uh, methods of uh, eradicating and fighting uh, those pathogens. So the only options that we really have left is control, uh, rigorous control seed material, uh, removing plants which are uh, infected uh, by either of those diseases, and just monitoring plantations for uh, the presence of FRP. And such a monitoring program was uh, begun in Poland in 1996 and has been carried out ever since. Last year, it was overseen by Dr. Natalia Kaczyńska, and from a Plant Health and Inspection Service, we uh, received almost 300 samples from all over the country, as you can see. And from this, we generated and identified over 230 isolates, uh, out of which I've chosen 34 for uh, my further work. And this work aims at uh, testing accuracy of Malditov for environmental analysis to compare it with PCR methods that has been used so far uh, in this monitoring, and also to add to local databases uh, which are uh, necessary for Malditov uh, to accurately uh, work. And here you can see the overview of our monitoring efforts, and it started by uh, collecting tissue from uh, infected uh, plant uh, pl plants, then uh, to isolate pectinolytic bacteria on a CDT medium, and then to uh, identified using multiplex PCR as well as more specific P PCR tests if required. Uh, further, I, mm, for my 34 isolates, I have additionally performed phenotypic uh, tests, additional PCR tests, as well as mar Malditov analysis, and I still hope to perform gene sequencing in the near future. And the multiplex was chosen as the first method for identification because it gives very a good broad overview of different uh, SRP presence in the sample, showing us under one experiment uh, DKA species Pectobacterium atrocepticum, as well as under the heading of PCC Pectobacterium protovorum, parmentieri, and other related species. And here you can see the results from uh, such, uh, uh, such multiplex in PCR, and you can see DKA species uh, in the upper left. Uh, below there are protovorum and or parmentieri, and next to it are atrocepticum species but there are still some uh, isolates which weren't properly identified. And for some reason, the, the, the ones in the upper right corner haven't uh, pr produced expected results. And so I performed additional PCR with more uh, specific Pectobacterium uh, primers, and the results are quite uh, clear. So after all of this, we still are left with several, seven un unidentified uh, isolates, as well as 24 in need of more specific identification. Uh, and I, sen I sent those uh, samples to Dr. Anna Kaczorowska at the Faculty of Biology so she could perform um, Malditov uh, identification. And uh, I received from her uh, uh, spectra for those isolates, uh, some of those uh, shown here. And 
all of those spectra after the work is complete will be uh, added to the uh, database uh, which is being developed for uh, SRP pathogens. And this is actually one of the main point of this work since uh, Malditov requires those uh, databases and the most existing databases are, are aimed uh, more so at human pathogens than, uh, than at uh, fetal pathogens. And as for the results of Malditov, you can see here in comparison to multiplex, it uh, gives, uh, they, they are, uh, uh, the results are in agreement uh, with one another. Uh, and although Malditov gives more accurate results, often showing species level identification, but there are a few which are still unidentified with Malditov, probably largely to do the fact that databases are uh, insufficient. And so I performed additional genomic profiling using ERIC PCR to hopefully group them with the ones we already identified. And I was able to do so for Parmentieri as well as Versatil and Atroceptitium. And finally, I also performed enzymatic tests on all, or the, on, on all of the isolates for uh, pectinases, cellulases, as well as proteases. And unfortunately, those results weren't very conclusive and were quite varied. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to actually distinguish different uh, species based on this. Although Gitya Solani does seem to have slightly la larger, uh, higher activity on those, uh, uh, on those media, mm, kind of setting it apart from the rest. And so in conclusion, Malditov uh, s s uh, as seen can function as a reliable tool with accuracy greater of, uh, than that of multiplex PCR and for many species can provide species level identification. It can also, its, its biggest advantage really is that it can be performed significantly faster than uh, multiple PCR tests required to achieve the same level of certainty, thus saving a lot of time, which is not a trivial advantage. And finally, all the spectra gathered during this work will enlarge our uh, database, which will help in future um, identifications with uh, this method. So I'd like to thank all of my team as well as uh, extend my gratitude toward uh, Anna Kaczorowska at uh, Biology Department for her work with Malditov. And so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, we have one. Um, can you go back to the slide where you compare the PCR results and the multi? Uh, yeah, this one. Uh, why? How do you explain that in the Malditov you cannot identify? one of the bacteria that you are able to identify by PCR? Uh, well, I think, again, that it may be just a problem with uh, accuracy of available databases. Uh, it m I don't know, it may be also some other issues that I am not uh, familiar with, but I don't think it's a fault with the method itself. I think the method itself is able to identify them properly. Thank you for that answer. Do we have any further questions? I don't see any, so I actually have one. I'm not uh, familiar with the ERIC PCR, so could you briefly explain to me and to all of us uh, its basis? Uh, I d don't really like, uh, know the exact specifics. It, it uses, uh, it, it compares a lot of uh, different uh, uh, gene from the whole of the bacterial genome to kind of show you uh, the, the smallest uh, di divergences between them. Like you can see even uh, similar, uh, spe the same species from different regions can show slightly different patterns because of you know, mutations and how they differ. So it, it gives you a very mm, like, uh, detailed comparison of the same species. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we have we have further question. Sorry, uh, knowing that the price of uh, whole genome sequencing is decreasing, 
how do you think this method, do you think your method of Malditov will be more useful than whole genome sequencing to identify the bacteria? Well, I don't think it's a question of which is more useful. I mean, it's good that we have, uh, that we understand many different methods so that we can uh, choose them accordingly to our specific needs. Malditov, uh, in this case, would be good because it's, uh, it allows us to quickly screen a big number of uh, samples with because it doesn't require a lot of sample preparation. You can just, you know, do a whole batch of samples and have like preliminary results early and then maybe choose to do additional tests based on that. Thank you. And our next speaker is Alexander Ostovir. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Alexander Ostovir, and I'm here today to tell you about my studies, which I've done in the laboratory of plant protection and biotechnology under the supervision of associate professor Małgorzata Valeron. My work focused on decoding the biology of Peptobacterium strains of different origins. Let me start with a brief introduction to the topic. Peptobacterium is a genus of phytopathogens isolated from vast range of crops and ornamentals. They are capable of causing a disease like soft rot, black leg, wilt on all sorts of plants. They were placed in the top 10 most important bacterial plant pathogens because of their high virulency and diversity. Genus is currently represented by 21 species and my studies are focused on three of them, Peptobacterium aroidarum, Colocasium and Zantidesia because of their unique quality to infect both monocodes and decodes. We are dealing with global warming. According to Food and Agriculture Organization, for the past 30 years, temperature in Europe has risen by two Celsius degrees. Plants trading and transportation are extensive and intensified nowadays more than ever. These two factors favor the spread of phytopathogens, enabling them to cause huge losses in agriculture, both on fields and in greenhouses. Thus, it is important to learn as much as we can about them. And this brings me to my main aim of the study, which was to learn about the biology of these three Peptobacterium species. And that includes their genetic and phenotypic characterization, as well as studying their uh, ability to infect monocodes and decodes. Here you can see map showing you the origin of 38 Peptobacterium strains that I worked on. As you may notice, the major part of them comes from Israel and Benelux countries, places which are known for ornamental plants production. During my studies, I've used various methods, but the most important ones were Rick A gene sequencing to confirm the identity of investigated strains, Eric PCR reaction for establishment of their diversity. I also used bioinformatic tool or 2 to for genomic comparison to compare, uh, to determine pheno phenotypic features of investigated strains, I performed pathogenicity assays on chosen monocodes and decodes. I also did biochemical tests for their fermentation abilities and enzymatic activity. Here you can see results of rig aging sequences, uh, sequencing. Uh, sequences obtained from uh, uh, investigated strains uh, marked with the bolded text were compared with those uh, retrieved from GeneBank database. First thing you can uh, notice based on that comparison is that strains isolated from decodes marked with the green leaves are clustering together with those isolated from monocodes, which indicates that they have no host specificity. Uh, analysis results provided uh, some additional insights. Uh, some of the strains were presumably wrongly classified, like for example, strain LMG2 415, which was uh, classified, which is classified as Peptobacterium aroidarum, should be reclassified to Peptobacterium colocasium species. Same goes for these two strains marked with the orange arrow. 
they were also classified as Pectobacterium aroiderum, while they clearly do not belong to that species. In the next step, I analyzed the diversity of the strains. Uh, every PCR reaction, reaction uh, show that strains uh, are extremely diverse and there is no correlation between their fingerprinting pattern and origin of isolation. With the exception for some strains isolated from Israel and Benelux countries, they appear to be identical, which may, may suggest uh, the possibility of them being clonal. As you can see in these pictures, all of, all of the investigated strains were virulent on both decodes and monocodes. It's worth noting here that even turmeric, uh, curcuma longa, a plant which is known for its antibacterial properties, was successfully infected by these bacteria. To compare phenotypic features of investigated strains, I, uh, compared, their, uh, um, uh, I compared their uh, enzymatic activity and fermentation ability. Results of applied assay show that strains do not differ much from each other. Uh, the results of genomic comparison of type strains using Ortoven2 show that investigated species share a vast majority of gene clusters. Relatively high number of unique gene clusters for each of the species uh, confirms their high diversity. To conclude, uh, investigated strains are extremely virulent on both monocodes and decodes, and they show no host specificity. Uh, despite being phenotypically indifferent, they are extremely diverse genetically, and there is no correlation between their fingerprinting pattern and origin of isolation, with the exception for strains uh, isolated from Israel and Benelux, which appeared to be clonal. Uh, to sum things up, uh, Pectobacterium shouldn't be overlooked because they pose a real threat to agriculture. Thank you for being here. That's all for me. If you have any questions, ask me and I will try my best to answer. Thank you, Alex. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, we have. Okay, so I was actually wondering uh, how is uh, global warming connected and other factors you mentioned, uh, how are they connected to the spread of this bacteria? I assume you talk about this slide. Okay, so uh, first thing, the transportation. And the thing I didn't mention is that the strains are, they are isolated from the plants that they do not necessarily infect. They can be in latent state on different plants that do not show uh, disease symptoms. And because the plant transportation is not really tightly regulated, they can travel from different places uh, over the world and uh, when they arrive in different places then they might uh, infect other plants like for example in greenhouse on in or in the storage and the other fact the rise of the temperature uh, works that way because this uh, bacterium are originally from exotic type of climate they prefer higher temperatures and even slight changes in temperature might enable them to show to infect the plants they wouldn't be able to infect otherwise in different circumstances. Mm, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Do we have any further questions? If not from the audience, then I would like to uh, then I would like to ask one uh, because you. Um, you said to us about how your uh, chosen strains differ, but you showed also one essay that uh, you were talking about their similarities. So could you uh, further explain? Uh, this essay is this one? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's not like they are really similar. It's just uh, the differences between them are so insignificant, it's hard to find a pattern to identify the strains based only on this uh, result. And uh, yes, that's uh, the answer. That's like, it, I didn't phrase it correctly, I guess, in the, f in the first place that they are not 
uh, indistinguishable, like totally. I mean, and the differences between them are so minimal, uh, phenotypically speaking, that it's hard to tell one species from another just basing on, based on that results of that assay. But I mm, state that again, that they are genetically really diverse. Okay, thank you for your answer and for your presentation. And our next speaker is Kacper Smarawinski. Welcome to my presentation. Uh, I will cover the topic of genomic and phenotypic profiling of Pectobacteria cestrains isolated from various water sources. Uh, Pectobacterium and Dicia are the subjects of my uh, research. Uh, they are phytopathogens causing soft throat and uh, Dicia, uh, soft throat and black leg diseases. Uh, they are gram negative rod shaped uh, facu facultative anaerobes and their pathogenicity is mainly uh, based on their plant cell wall degrading enzymes, including pectinases, cellulases, and proteases. In 2012, they were placed on a list of top 10 plant pathogenic bacteria. Uh, their targets are vegetables and ornamentals, and today we know 21 pectobacterium species and 12 dicia species. And after decades of research, the discoveries of new species of those genera are still accelerating. Uh, spread of pectinolytic bacteria is important topic of recent studies in the field, and it is because there are no reliable effective measures for, uh, for limiting it. Uh, pectinolytic bacteria are commonly found in uh, waterways, which could be used for irrigation when counteracting the effects of climate change, and this could lead to infecting new crops. For these reasons, many projects in several countries were performed to monitor the pre bacterial presence in waterways. The primary target of the, those uh, bacteria uh, is potato, which is for many years acknowledged as the third most important food crop in the world. Uh, and it's because it provides more dry matter and protein per hectare, as well as uses less water than major cereal crops. Uh, and in Europe alone, we can observe uh, damage on potato plantations, uh, causing uh, millions of damage worth millions of damage. Uh, in this project, I aimed to recognize whether various waterways are important sources of spreading of pectinolytic bacteria, uh, assess the virulence of the tested strains, and uh, evaluate their biodiversity on the level of phenotype and genotype. Uh, I had 46 uh, bacterial strains uh, isolated in Polish waterways that needed identification and 70 already identified pectinolytic strains uh, from five different countries. And they included Dicia chrysanthemi, Dicia aquatica, Dicia zae, Pectobacterium aquaticum, and Pectobacterium quasi-aquaticum species. Uh, moving on to methodology, uh, 46 unidentified isolates were preliminary identified on CVP medium and later PC, uh, PCR based two species identified with multiplex PCR and Pectobacterium genus specific PCR. Uh, afterwards, all pectinolytic strains were uh, subjected to uh, sequence similarity analysis based on DNA X and REC A genes and genomic profiling based on BOX and ERIC PCRs. Uh, lastly, uh, all these strains were phenotypically, phenotypically characterized. Uh, this stage included measuring their ability to macerate potato tissue and measuring their plant cell wall degrading enzymes activity. Um, uh, the identification with uh, mm, CVP medium and uh, PCR methods uh, allowed to uh, 
introduce four new pectinolytic strains to this study. Uh, the Pectobacterium genus specific PCR showed that they belong to Pectobacterium genus and multiplex PCR allowed to assign them as either Pectobacterium carotovorum or Pectobacterium parmentieri species. Thus, 74 pectinolytic strains were analyzed in this uh, study. Uh, genomic profiling was done for all uh, analyzed strains and based on uh, BOX and ERIC PCR, uh, every strain that showed differences in their genomic profile were selected for uh, phenotypic analysis, analysis and comparison of their RecA and DNA X genes. Uh, this uh, analysis uh, showed the, the, the sequence similarity analysis showed that uh, the four new pectinolytic strains were uh, belonged to Pectobacterium versatile species rather than Pectobacterium carotovorum or Pectobacterium parmentieri. Uh, the same analysis for Pectobacterium aquaticum and Pectobacterium quasi-aquaticum allowed to reclassify the first Pectobacterium aquaticum strain isolated in Poland to the latter species. Uh, the same uh, analysis for Dikiazae Dikia showed many uh, groups of high similarity strains and indicated that the reference strain of this species was most distantly related from all analyzed strains. Uh, the phenotypic analysis showed repeating patterns. Uh, firstly, Dikia aquatica and Dikiazae showed the uh, highest uh, ability to macerate potato tissue, uh, and also Dikiaza showed greatest biodiversity between uh, their uh, strains. Uh, all of the phenotypic uh, results were also compared to Dikia solani strain, which is known as high virulence, uh, a strain of with high virulence. Uh, pectinases activity assay showed that Dikia genus uh, has higher activity assays than Pectobacterium genus. Cellulases activity assay uh, confirmed earlier observations and with lowest deviations shows most clearly how Dikiaza strains differ from each other. Uh, proteases activity assay was the only uh, test where Pectobacterium species had similar results to Dikia strains. And to conclude, uh, analyzed uh, strains isolated from uh, uh, water were proven to be virulent. Uh, Dikia Zae and Dikia Aquatica strains showed uh, highest activity uh, of plant cell wall degrading enzymes. And also Dikia Zae showed very uh, significant biodiversity. Moreover, uh, waterways acro across several countries contain many pectinolytic strains uh, proven to be virulent and could lead to black leg and soft rot, soft rot outbreaks upon being used for irrigation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Katsper, very much for the presentation. And do we have any questions from the audience? OK, I don't see any. So I will have a question for you. You mentioned that list of uh, top 10 um, plant pathogens, uh, and that piqued my interest. Do you know what were the basis of that uh, such a list, creating such a list? scientists uh, assign them based on uh, uh, how how much damage those uh, bacteria cause and uh, how often they are met in in research when an an analyzing the damage on on in agriculture okay thank you uh, have any questions come up if not then thank you very much for that presentation Our next speaker is Robert Burzyński. Hello everyone, my name is Robert Burzyński and today I would like to tell you about my master's project which I've done in the laboratory of biologically active compounds under the supervision of Professor Robert Krzyzowski. And the title of my presentation is Hackman PCR based method for quantitative detection of phages from Xenolithovirus species. So firstly, let's start from the aim of my project. 
I wanted to establish new real-time detection and quantification methods, which would be able to estimate the number of bacteriophage particles in the environmental sample. And for that, the main method which I used was the Tagman PCR method. This method uses the Tagman probe, uh, which consists of the quencher and the fluorophore. So the quencher silences the fluorescence of the fluorophore, but when the amplification of genetic material occurs, fluorophore is freed from the probe and fluorescence can be observed. And this method enables real-time quantitative detection of bacteriophages and also characterizes in high specificity and sensitivity. And the species of the bacteriophages that I was working on was the Bunalike virus species. And the example of this uh, species, which I was working in the laboratory, was the FIDE5 type strain. So this species is commonly observed in Europe, in countries like Belgium, Denmark, Poland, and few others, for example. And the hosts for these bacteriophages are often bacteria which are responsible for the um, plant diseases, like Dicchia solani, for example. And that's why uh, we are working on these phages, because at least right now, there is no uh, detection method for these species of phages. And we would like to optimize it and um, publish this. And uh, these uh, phages characterized in having lytic cycle. And here in this picture, you can see the uh, picture of the bacteriophage FIDE5 under the transmission electron microscope with the icosahedral head and the uh, tail of the bacteriophage. So let's go to the workflow of my research. Firstly, I performed some bioinformatic analysis of phages genomes. I compared them using the BLAST. After that, I performed genome alignment with Mega11 software. Then I designed primers and Tagman probes based on the results of the genome alignment, uh, which was followed by the multiplication of bacteriophages uh, for which I used the double agar overlay assay. And uh, after that, I isolated their DNA. Uh, after that, uh, from the whole uh, primer pairs, I selected two uh, for the Tagman tests. And after the Tagman tests, there was time for the test with environmental samples. So uh, before I've done this genome alignment, I've done uh, this bioinformatic uh, analysis, as I said. And uh, based on these results, uh, which you can see short snap of it here, uh, uh, 14 short DNA fragments, which encode structural proteins of the phages, were chosen. And based on these short fragments, 31 primer pairs with Tagman probes were designed. And I've done that using the uh, software, which is available on the GeneScript website. After that, I uh, multiplicated phages and isolated their DNA, and it was time for the selection of working primers from these 31 uh, pairs of primers that I designed. And for that, I used the isolated DNA and these primers. And here you can see the example of one of the results of the gel electrophoresis, agarose gel electrophoresis, where I uh, checked uh, if the primers will produce any product. So as you can see, some don't even produce any product and other produce very nice intensive stripes. After that, I chose 15, 15 uh, primer pairs for the next step where I use the QPCR with the cyber green. And firstly, I needed to reduce the number of the uh, pairs of primers from 15 to about five, uh, eight. And for that, I performed QPCR with single, uh, uh, with one uh, concentrations of phage DNA, and based on the lowest values of cycle threshold from the PCR, QPCR, uh, I selected the eight ones uh, with the lowest concentricity uh, values. Uh, and after that, for the eight uh, primer pairs which were chosen, I uh, performed various uh, QPCRs with uh, different concentrations of phage DNA, and uh, for and after that, I needed to calculate the coefficient of determination, which is R square, uh, for these eight pairs of, of primers. And an example of these calculations with the graphs you can see here. And, uh, sorry, uh, and here you can see the table with the results of these uh, R square values. And based on these results, the primer pairs 20 and 22 were chosen for the Tagman PCR. For the Tagman uh, PCR, I used this uh, primer pairs 20 and 22 and their probes. And as you can see in the both tables, as the concentration of the phage DNA goes down, 
the values of cycle threshold goes up. So we can say that it is working like it is supposed to do. And the detection limit of the method was defined at 10 nanograms per microliter and also 100 PFU per microliter. Uh, and the last part were the environment, uh, TACMA PCR with environmental samples. And for that, uh, samples were collected from potatoes and soil. And here you can see examples of the uh, results for the potato samples. Uh, they were very similar for the soil. As, and uh, as you can see, unfortunately here, at least to this day, I wasn't able to fully optimize because the CT values are almost the same for the every concentrations and they, very, they are very similar to the negative control. And to summarize, during the research, working TACMON PCR detection method was achieved with detection limit at about 10 nanograms per microliter and 100 PFU per microliter. And uh, unfortunately, due to some problems with performing this TACMON PCR with environmental samples, addi additional testing will be needed in the future. So uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I will ha be happy to answer. Thank you, Robert. Are there, any, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, we have one. I'm interested why you used only two pro, uh, uh, pairs of primers with the probes for TACMAN, because you had about 30, if I'm not mistaken? Yes. So firstly, uh, like I said, I needed to select the working ones from the not working ones. And you probably wonder why I didn't use, for example, eight Tacman probes. Mm -hmm. And the reason for it is quite simple, in my opinion, because the Tacman probes are quite expensive. So it was easier to, um, to optimize the method with the cyber green uh, instead of using uh, eight different Tacman probes, for example. OK, thank you. Any further questions? Yes, we have one. Yes, yes. For the purposes of live stream, you should talk to the mic. So I'm right, at <laughs> I'm right there. <laughs> okay. uh, I have a question. Because you showed the concentration of um, nucleic acid that needs uh, to be there uh, to like have a band uh, in your assay. Is this concentration even achievable uh, in the environmental samples? What does the literature say? Uh, are there enough phage particles to have such amount of nucleic acid for this detection? Uh, Thanks. So basically, uh, like mm, there was, I said, like uh, there's 100 PFU detection. So PFU is like the plaque forming unit. So uh, we know that this uh, species of phage just creates about 100 particles per from one bacteria cell. So in theoretic, ther theoretically, uh, it is possible to um, find out the infection of one bacteria by the bacteriophages. But uh, right now, we didn't test it. Thank you for that answer. Do we have any questions further? If not, then I will have one. You mentioned in your methods, uh, if I say it correctly, double, double agar overflow uh, method. Overlay, yeah. oh, overlay, I'm sorry. Uh, what was the purpose of using that method? Uh, so this is the type of method which allows us for the growing of the phages because uh, we have like a double, um, two, uh, two versions of agar, uh, which are on one, one is on the top of another. And uh, basically, um, we um, mix the bacteria uh, with the phages, which were available in the laboratory. And uh, the phages are growing uh, thanks to the proximity of the bacteria in this, um, on these plates with these uh, double agars. OK, thank you very much.
And now that we have the presentation, our next speaker is Martina Muszyńska. Hello, everyone. My name is Martina Muszyńska, and I'd like to present to you findings on my master thesis, which is called Toxicity of Secondary Metabolite Mixtures from Josea Giganta and Identification of Anti-Mercable Constituents. Josea family is a group of carnivorous plants containing many interesting secondary metabolites. Some of them have antimicrobial properties, for example, naphtokinones and their representative plumbagin. However, they are also cytotoxic to eukaryotic cells, which limits their potential uses in medicine. Uh, meanwhile, extracts from Drosea gigantea, the plant which I was focusing on, also exhibit uh, antimicrobial activity. However, it is uh, not clear what is, which metabolites are responsible for this activity. Uh, additionally, it has been previously found that extracts uh, from this plant are non-toxic against Senelal diffuse elegans as a model eukaryote. For these reasons, uh, the objectives of my project were as follows. Uh, identification of antimicrobial secondary metabolites in Josea gigantea and testing the toxicity of uh, the most active fraction of the extract in mice. The fraction which was used in all the experiments was obtained as follows. Uh, the plant tissue was uh, obtained from in vitro cultures and subjected to extraction. The extract was then purified on C18 columns and uh, the fraction which didn't bind at all to C18 was previously found to be the most active against bacteria, which is why it's called the active fraction and why I chose it for all the experiments. Usually when identifying compounds in a complex mixture, HPLC would uh, firstly be used. However, I was only focusing on antimicrobial constituents, so I incorporated a TLC-oriented approach in which the fraction was first separated on TLC plates, then the uh, chromatograms were overlaid with medium mixed with bacteria, and bacterial growth was visualized by spraying the medium surface with MPT solution. Uh, this gave us the information which metabolites to focus on, significantly reducing the amount of time necessary to identify antimicrobial ones. With this in mind, seven bands uh, on the TLC chromatogram were numbered and isolated from the silica gel and subjected to HPLC-MS analysis in order to initially identify them. After comparing the results uh, of the molecular uh, mass with known data about secondary metabolites in Josea giganta, uh, metabolites were identified as it's shown in the table. Unfortunately, results for metabolite number four were inconclusive and it remains unknown. The rest, however, remains, uh, uh, belongs mostly to the group of uh, naphtokinone glycosides, except for uh, metabolite number eight, which is Drosaron, which is a uh, naphtokinone. I used the overlay method to test the uh, antibacterial properties of metabolites against key pathogens, Staphylococcus aureus, Escherichia coli, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Only one metabolite was active against uh, Staphylococcus aureus and Escherichia coli, and it was metabolite number four when we compared the, uh, the images with the legend. Uh, no metabolite was active against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. The fraction was also tested for its potential toxic effect, effects uh, in the mice. The animals were divided into two groups. In the experimental group, the, an the animals were uh, fed with a highly concentrated fraction. What's important to note that uh, the concentration was much higher than the lowest antibacterial dose. Uh, and in the control group, the animals were fed with uh, the vehicle in which the fraction was suspended. By the end of the experiment, all the animals were alive. And to terminate it, uh, the animals were sacrificed, their blood was collected, and then I collected and weighed their organs. Uh, the blood was also tested for uh, morphological and biochemical parameters, and all the results were compared between experimental and control group and also compared to reference data found in literature. For weight uh, parameters, uh, we can see no mm, significant differences between experimental and control group, except for time loss mass. Uh, the rest uh, of the differences are only between those two groups and uh, reference data. For the blood morphology, there were no differences between experimental and control group. And when it comes to blood biochemistry, um, we can see that uh, AST and ALT levels in experimental and control group uh, were more varied than in reference data, which is most likely a result of sample hemolysis. 
the rest of the results uh, uh, shows only one significant difference uh, between experimental and control group with total protein concentration, which was higher in experimental group. And uh, the rest of the differences uh, can be seen uh, in the glucose levels where uh, the levels were slightly lower in both uh, experimental and control group. And uh, uh, urea and albumin's uh, levels were a bit uh, higher. Uh, to summarize, uh, secondary metabolites uh, from, the, uh, from the active fraction of uh, Drosera giganta extract belong mostly to the naphthequinone glycosides uh, group. Um, only metabolite number four was active against uh, Staphylococcus aureus and Escheri herpali. And at the same time, uh, metabolite four couldn't be identified by HPLCMS and it needs to be analyzed by other means, which is still work in progress. Uh, and finally, highly concentrated active fraction didn't cause any negative uh, effects in mice, but the toxicity should be tested further. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? If no, then I'm curious, uh, why, uh, do you have any ideas why that uh, fourth metabolite wasn't detected by your method? Um, well, uh, on the mass uh, spectrum, there were multiple peaks, uh, which uh, couldn't be matched with any results uh, for metabolites found previously in this plan. Um, so the, there's uh, simply need uh, for an ad another method which uh, doesn't um, depend on, uh, the, on this data. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? If no, then thank, for s thank you for your presentation. last presentation of this panel, Stanisław Rugin. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Stanisław Rugin and due to that uh, my presentation is the last uh, at this panel and I assumed you uh, it can be a little bit tired, I will present you uh, one, more, uh, mm, run one more project uh, described by the title Cultivation of Selected Species of Drosera in Plant for Melicited Periodic Planted Cultures to Eradicate Pseudomonas aeruginosa which is supervised uh, by Professor Aleksandra Kruliska and has been done in laboratory of biologically active compounds. And my research is focused on uh, carnivorous plants, source of biologically active compounds produced during uh, secondary metabolism, like naphthoquinones, flavonoids, or phenolic acids. And uh, the plants produced uh, them uh, are rare and endemic, so we have to cultivate them in in vitro culture. And uh, compounds produced uh, by them from many others possess the antimicrobial activities, but there are some problems uh, with that because uh, main constituents of extracts, uh, naphthoquinones like flambagin and, and uh, ramantacion, are active against gram-positive pathogens like Staphylococcus aureus, uh, including uh, multidrug resistance uh, strains, but they're inactive against uh, gram-negative pathogens like uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and uh, those, uh, th those pathogens are naturally resistant to them. And what's more, those uh, naphthoquinones are highly cyto cytotoxic, so uh, we try to find different compounds uh, in uh, plant tissues that uh, will be active against Pseudomonas aeruginosa and other gram-negative pathogens and also uh, are less cytotoxic. And uh, during my research, I focused on little larger scale of cultivation using plants from bioreactors. Uh, plants inside these bioreactors grow in the inner baskets and thanks to the pump system and uh, electric clocks, the air is flowed into the basket, uh, into the uh, plant form and make liquid uh, medium bubbling washing plants uh, deliver them nutrition. And uh, also I have tested the influence of uh, elicitors, which are uh, agents and uh, cultivation alternation that uh, cause uh, plants response uh, to them. And thanks to that, they may uh, increase the activity of extract by changing the content of secondary metabolites. And I have tested the lack of nitrogen, the addition of, of L-phenylalanine, which is a precursor for secondary metabolites, 
the lizards of uh, gram-negative uh, bacteria, and the culture with Calitria coprocarpa, which is uh, common water plants, a uh, source of uh, precursor for those uh, secondary metabolites. And here's my workflow. I have cultivated plants in, uh, in uh, in vitro liquid uh, cultures and plant form cultures with and without elicitor. Then I have extracted uh, secondary metabolites using ultrasonically assisted sulking out uh, with CHF. And then I have tested the uh, extracts uh, in case of uh, bactericidal activity, the cytotoxicity, and the content of, of, of them. And I have, I have started with four promising species, Drosera, Drosera derbiensis and Drosera zigzagia, with the main constituents of extract, uh, the plumbagin, and Drosera cayenensis and Drosera ultramafica with the Riamantaceon. And first of all, I have tested their extracts on less resistant uh, example of gram-negative pathogen, which is Escherichia coli. And to do that, I have determined the minimal bactericidal concentration. So the less uh, MBC value, the higher activity of extracts. And as you can see, the highest activity uh, of extracts uh, performed Drosera zigzagia. So I focus only on this uh, species. And here you can see the results of elicitation. The, the, the lack of nitrogen and the, uh, uh, and the addition of l phenylalanine didn't increase the activity of extracts compared to the control. And the same situation is here. The uh, Rautella or Nitolytica lizard and Co-Culture also didn't increase the activity of uh, extracts compared to the control. So any uh, tested uh, elicitors uh, doesn't work uh, like that. Anyway, Drosera zigzaga is an example of a species uh, which extract uh, contain uh, compounds active against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So I wanted to better understand uh, what is in the extracts and I performed CLC. Uh, and then I have collected three fractions from uh, the separation. Of course, I dismissed Plumbagin as an example of a compound which is uh, inactive against uh, gram-negative pathogens and is also very high cytotoxicity. And as you can see, the fraction three possesses the activity against Pseudomonas aeruginosa with much higher uh, activity, uh, MBC value, uh, than the whole extract. But you have to remember that this fraction didn't contain uh, cytotoxic Plumbagin, so it's, it should be also less cytotoxic. And here you can see the HPLC of uh, uh, whole extracts. As you can see, mm, this, uh, this, this, uh, this extract contains many different uh, compounds represented uh, by uh, the peak on the chromatogram and very high amount of uh, plumbagin. Uh, fraction three also contains many different unidentified compounds, but this uh, fraction doesn't contain cytotoxic plumbagin. What caused, as you can see there, that uh, this fraction is much less uh, cytotoxic. The, uh, the last dots on the graph represent the uh, MBC value against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And as you can see, whole extract in the active uh, concentration fills almost 90% of uh, eukaryotic cells. Uh, and fraction three is uh, much less cytotoxic, uh, even in much higher uh, concentration. And uh, to sum up my presentation uh, and my research, Drosera zigzaga is a species uh, which uh, is source of biologically active compounds active against the gram-negative pathogens, including Pseudomonas aeruginosa. The elicitors uh, that I tested uh, uh, doesn't, uh, didn't increase the activity of uh, extracts, and fraction three, isolated from the Drosera zigzagia extracts, contains unidentified compounds uh, active against uh, gram-negative pathogens, including Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and also this fraction is much less cytotoxic. And the future aim is to identify those compounds and try to isolate them. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you, Stanislav. Do we have any questions? If not, uh, I noticed actually on the uh, that TLC analysis that uh, when you compare the fraction and the total extract, there are some bands in fraction that aren't present in total extract. Could you explain that? Yes, uh, this is the separation in different phase than, uh, than here. And uh, the main difference uh, between those uh, are there, actually. And this is plumbagin. So Drosera zigzagia, uh, of course, contain, uh, whole extracts contain the mm, plumbagin and fraction three not. What's more, fraction uh, three is, of course, the part of whole extract, so there should be some uh, difference uh, between those uh, images. But uh, those differences uh, can be also seen because the fraction three was used in much higher concentration than the uh, whole extracts, uh, because during purification we might uh, lose some uh, uh, some compounds, and that's why we have to 
uh, use it in the much higher concentration. So that's, 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 what, that's why probably the difference between those images. Thank you. Have any questions come up? Yes, we have one, okay. I will be right there. Thank you. About nitrogen depletion, maybe I missed that, but first you show dif um, that, as I understood first, that uh, mm, when plants are grown without nitrogen, you induce a lot the production of secondary metabolites, right? But then, oh, I missed the point is on the here? figure. Is this here? Yes. This is uh, l phenylalanine. Okay. Yes, is it you, okay. you mean this, uh, this graph? Yes. Okay, okay. It's because then in the conclusion you said that addition or depletion of the nitrogen do not really change the antibacterial activity. Okay, but now I get the point. Yes, uh, the, the difference between the dose, uh, the, those bars uh, is actually uh, decreased activity of, uh, okay. of ex extracts. So I, I did Yes, okay, that. I get the point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Then I would like to thank for all the presenters for the, their great work. And I invite you all to the coffee break. Thank you.
good good afternoon uh, it's time for the last presentation panel uh, i would like to invite the first speaker it's uh, felicia uh, gaidowska the floor is yours hello is it working yes okay so good afternoon everyone my name is felicia gaidowska and today i would like to introduce you to my master's thesis which is entitled Small Extracellular Vesicles as a Source of Antigens for CD1A Mediated T-Cell Responses. I conducted this study in a laboratory of experimental and translational immunology under the supervision of Professor Danuta Gutowska of Szek. So, EVs, uh, there are small heterogeneous organelles which are secreted from the cell. There are three main types, so namely apoptotic bodies, microvesicles and exosomes and their distinct biogenesis is uh, reflected both in their cargo, so for example, uh, proteins and nucleic acids, as well as in the composition of the lipids within their phospholipid bilayer. So uh, it was previously proven by some studies that EVs and particularly uh, exosomes can take part in cancer progression. Uh, so here, uh, for example, they can alter immune responses. As for uh, many of you probably remember, uh, peptides can be presented by MHC class 1 and 2 molecules and trigger immune responses. Uh, and as it turns out, not only uh, peptides can be presented, but also lipids. So here we can see CD1 molecule, uh, which presents lipid antigens to T cells. And how it works is that TCR can recognize either just CD1A or CD1A with antigen, or be blocked by non-permissive ligands that are protruding from the uh, molecule. This can either lead to T cell activation or inhibition of that process. And it was previously proven here in the lab that SEVs upon digestion with PLA2 can uh, release lip lipid antigens that can be further uh, presented by CD1 molecule and alterate immune responses. So my study is quite similar, though I investigated three EV types. And apart from uh, interferon gamma secretion analysis, I also analyzed uh, interleukin 10, 13, and 17. And the aim of the study was to investigate whether SEVs from different cellular sources may contribute their lipids as antigens during CD1A mediated uh, responses uh, in cancer settings, but also in comparison to other EV types. I investigated seven different cell lines, so namely HACAT, HEC293T, HEPG2, HILA, and THP1, JURCAT, and K562. Uh, as for the EVs isolation, firstly, I added EV depleted medium to the cells at around 90% confluence and then collected it at, uh, up after 48 hours. Uh, firstly, I removed cell debris and later on I could isolate apoptotic bodies, microvesicles and finally exosome enriched fraction. Uh, moving on to the results, uh, here you can see the video of NTA analysis. So NTA can help us estimate the size and the concentration of particles in a sample. Uh, and it is analyzing their Brownian motions uh, upon illumination of it with uh, laser beam. So here we can see a, uh, an example of size analysis by NTA. Here are apoptotic bodies, which uh, you can see here are very variable in size. Uh, here is exosome enriched fraction, which consists mostly of the smallest particles and microvesicles which fall somewhere in, in between those two. And as I mentioned before, we can also measure concentration, estimate con concentration, so that's also what I did. And here are adherent cells and non-adherent cells for apoptotic bodies, microvesicles, and finally exosome enriched fraction. Uh, so in my study, I wanted to investigate whether uh, lipids within EVs could alterate immune responses, and that's why I performed ELISPOT. ELISPOT is uh, an experiment quite similar to uh, ELISA, however, it does not measure the concentration of the cytokine released by the cells, but it measures the number of cells which release this, uh, secrete this cytokine. So here I pulsed antigen-presenting cells, K562, CD1A, or empty vector, with PLA2 digested EVs. And afterwards, I uh, co-incubated them, co-cultured them with T cells on interferon gamma antibody coated ELISPOT plate and after incubation I analyzed the number of the spots which can be visible here. So here as a general rule we can see that um, uh, interferon gamma responses were generally lower in empty vector control than in CD1A control. 
uh, which su suggests CD1A restriction. And within those CD1A uh, variants, we can see that all of the samples fall underneath the, uh, the control and pulse control, uh, which suggests the uh, reduction of the T cell response. And I also measured uh, secretion of IL-10, 13, and 17 by ELISA. Uh, levels of IL-10 and 13 were very low and negligible. Uh, however, IL-17 showed quite similar trend as the interferon gamma secretion. Uh, however, more studies are still needed to f draw any final conclusions. And as for, uh, as for last but not least lipidomics, uh, I gave out my SEVs EVs samples uh, to the analysis of their, of the component, of their lipid component. Uh, and it is still preliminary data. However, the point here is to somehow associate the level of T cell activation uh, with the lipids that uh, constitute the EVs from different cell lines. And for the conc to conclude, uh, EV-derived lipid antigens isolated from different cell lines uh, reduce CD1A restricted responses, which is seen by the interferon gamma secretion. IL-10 and 13 do not seem to be secreted in, uh, upon T cell activation in that system. Impact of secretion of IL-17 still needs to be investigated. And the effect is dependent on the cell type and EV type, as well as uh, with large inter-individual variability. And as for future prospects, uh, cancer cell EVs reducing CD1A mediated T cell responses con could consist a novel immune tumor evasion strategy, which needs to be further investigated, as well as analysis of lipid droplets as a source of lipids for EVs within different cell lines is also planned. Uh, here I would like to thank everyone who, was, uh, who took part in this project, so whole DGO lab, but particularly Professor Danuta gutowska Owsiak, Adrian Kobiela, Mikołaj Klimczuk and Finita Panek, as well as Dr. Veronika Havel-Belka, and I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the, your presentation. Is there any questions? Thanks for the presentation. Could you please elucidate why did you choose this particular cell line as an anti antigen presenting cell line in the L spot? So uh, I use K562 CD1A and MC vector because uh, normally CD1A can be presented uh, that can be on uh, presented by can be on uh, dendritic cells, for example. However, they also uh, have MHC class one and two. And here we wanted to see uh, the, uh, how the CD1A can present those lipid antigens. We wanted to focus on the lipid antigens only, not the peptide. So this is more specific response. Okay, are there any, okay. Hi, uh, hi. Do you know maybe how these extracellular vesicles can alternate these uh, immune responses uh, in cancer? Uh, yes, so there are many studies on that. Uh, but for example, uh, as I said, the EVs can carry a cargo inside, uh, so or on the surface of the EVs. So here uh, there are studies that, are, that show that they can contain IL-10, which is uh, immunosuppressive, so antigen-presenting cells wouldn't present uh, antigens for the I I immune cells, so they, there wouldn't be any response to cancer. Uh, and also there was a study showing that uh, there is present this ligand PD-L1, which can uh, also uh, alterate the the fact that the T cells wouldn't be able to recognize cancer cells. Okay, thank you, Felicia. Thank you.
my name is Viktor Krukowski, and today I would like to show you results of my master thesis called Identification of Plasmids in Clostridio Uses DBCF, done under supervision of Krzysztof Kings, PhD, in a laboratory of molecular bacteriology. As you may have guessed from the title, my main aim of the study was to uh, develop methods for isolation and identification of plasmids in clinical strains of Clostridio Uses difficile. Uh, Clostridia uses difficile is a gram-positive, spore-forming bacteria, which uh, toxicity comes mainly from proteins toxin A and toxin B, along with other hydrolytic enzymes, which cause epithelial cell death in the colon, leading to diarrhea, and in rare cases, sepsis, and even death. Disease caused by, uh, disease caused by Clostridia uses difficile is called CDHD, or CDI for short, with CDI being the preferred term. It's a disease that's non-socomial and community acquired, meaning that you can get it uh, in hospital and outside of it. It is a threat not only in healthcare, but also to the economy because of infections in newly born piglets, which leads to their death and losses for farmers in the meat industry. As you can see from this table, uh, plasmids in Clostridoides difficile have a wide uh, range of size, from around 7,000 uh, base pairs to around 145 kilo base pairs. Although we can uh, pinpoint some key characteristics about uh, some of them, most of these plasmids are so-called cryptid plasmids, meaning that their presence in the cell has no observable uh, effect on their phenotype. Because of this, and the other fact that strains that are isolated from epidemic and, uh, epidemics and strains present in hospitals, uh, which carry plasmids more often than the general population, we can guess that those plasmids may have some role in their virulence. So usually those plasmids are isolated and studied uh, using uh, pulse field gel electrophoresis, which requires its own specialistic uh, and quite costly equipment, and uh, this separation can take even up to a day sometimes. So I wanted to uh, isolate these uh, plasmids using uh, colony PCR, sorry, uh, to identify these plasmids using uh, colony PCR, and in order to do that, I needed to design primers, which were meant to amplify the uh, as many plasmids as possible using as few primers as possible. So in order to do that, I first started with uh, downloading plasmid sequences from uh, gene banks. After that, I tested if there, have any, if there is any uh, phages uh, in those sequences by using bioinformatics to count faster. After that, I grouped uh, those sequences based on their size and aligned them in order to find any uh, sequences that are shared between those uh, plasmids. After that, I checked if the sequences uh, I identified are present in uh, Clostridius difficile genome in order to uh, avoid false positives uh, by detecting uh, phages or uh, genome of the bacteria. After that, I designed the primers using uh, Oligo software, and you can see uh, the primers I designed here. So uh, this picture shows uh, one of the gels that I did, uh, which shows results of colony PCR. And as you can see, we can observe two bands, uh, which are corresponding for a size of around 100 base pair. And uh, this product shows us that we have a positive result for presence of plasmids, which are about uh, 12 kilo base pairs in size. Uh, after I identified this strain, uh, I wanted to isolate it and send it to a sequencing lab, uh, but uh, this proven to be uh, quite challenging, as even after using two different keys for plasmid isolation, I couldn't get enough of the pure plasmid uh, for the company, and only after using the third kit, which was designed to handle up to uh, 500 milliliters of media, I was able to get enough of the plasmid uh, to be sent uh, to the sequencing lab. After getting the results, uh, there was uh, two sequences of, of the plasmids, one of which uh, had uh, around uh, 12 kilo base pairs uh, of size, which corresponds to the uh, colony PCR, uh, but uh, another one was about uh, 5,000 uh, kilo base in pair, and it wasn't detected on the colony PCR, although after running a normal PCR with the isolated plasmid as a template, I was able to get a dim band which uh, wasn't uh, 
around 100 Bert pairs, which the primers were uh, designed for. And uh, because of that, I think that uh, there needs to be uh, more sequences studied uh, for this uh, primer design uh, in order to show all possible plasmids. After uh, finding these uh, uh, sequences, I used another bioinformatics tool to, in, uh, to identify open reading frames inside of them. And after getting this data, I again used BLAST in order to find if there are any similar proteins uh, to the one uh, encoded on this plasmid. As you can see, uh, most of these open reading frames weren't undatified, and the only ones that uh, were identified uh, correspond to uh, proteins which are uh, responsible for uh, DNA transcription and replication. And because of that, we can't uh, guess if the uh, plasmid is maintained in the cell uh, because of these proteins. So to summarize, uh, it is still not quite certain why some of these plasmids are kept in the cell. And uh, plasmids in Clostridia is difficile can be detected using colony PCR. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any, someone has a question? So do you know what kind of treatments are, are available for Clostridioides difficile infections? Mm -hmm. So uh, the first uh, thing would be to treat the patient with antibiotics, mainly vancomycin and metronidazole, which are uh, antibiotics often used uh, in these cases. Uh, if the disease is reoccurring, uh, there is also a recommendation for using uh, probiotics and uh, fecal transfer uh, of uh, microbiota, uh, which proven to be quite successful for such patients. And uh, if the case is severe and uh, the antibiotics aren't working, a surgical intervention may be needed with at least partial colectomy, meaning uh, removal of a part of the intestine. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, someone also has a question? So hello, I just have one question. How can your the results of your studies be somehow translated to any any practical use? Mm -hmm. As I said, uh, these uh, strains that I used are mm -hmm. hypervirulent strains, meaning that uh, the disease caused by them is uh, more severe than uh, with normal strains. And when you have a patient, uh, you might want to know if uh, they need high priority of treatment. So. Uh, checking if uh, the strain that is infecting your patient has those plasmids may be an indication uh, that you need to treat this uh, matter urgently. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today I am honored to present you the so far results of my master's project. My name is Małgorzata Kurinska, and this project is being held under the supervision of Dr. Alessandro Negri in Laboratory of Molecular Bacteriology. The title of the presentation is the same as the one of my master thesis, Bacillus subtilis for surface display of the tissue inhibitors of metalloproteinases. The hypothesis behind this project was that the display of tissue inhibitors of metalloproteinases 2 and 3, which in short is TIMP2 and TIMP3, and this is how I will be referring to them as later, on the surface of Bacillus subtilis spores will enable the prevention of periodontal tissue damage caused by matrix metalloproteinases. Periodontitis, which in Polish is Zapalenia przedzębia, is the second most common oral disease that is the consequence of excessive plaque buildup, which gradually covers an increasing area on the tooth until it reaches under the gum line. This results in the inflammation, and the inflammation results in the, um, uh, the shock. 
it creates an ideal environment for the bacteria growth and the presence of inflammation in the bacteria results in the involvement of many pro-inflammatory molecules which gradually leads to the activation of matrix metalloproteinases. And those metalloproteinases they can be also named as NMPs in short. And these are calcium-dependent proteolytic enzymes which primary function is to participate in both physiological and pathological processes of degradation and the modeling of extracellular matrix components. This including angio angiogenesis, um, embryogenesis, uh, degenerative diseases and tumors. Out of all MMPs present in the human body, the two most involved in periodontitis are MMP8 and MMP9. Nutrition inhibitors, or in short TIMS, create stable and specific complexes, and this binding is reversible, and the inhibition uh, involves blocking the substrate access to the meta matrix metalloproteinase, and we can distinguish four uh, TIMS from TIM1 to TIM4. The aim of my project was to create a stable fusion between two of these four proteins, code B and CGA with TIM2 and TIM3, and also to assess the presence of this fusion on the surface of the spores. This was done starting by a codon adaptation because TIMs are human proteins and their sequence needs to be adjusted to the bacterial translation machinery. Then gen gen the genes were synthesized by an outside company and delivered to us in plasmids. The sequence corresponding for either TIM or code proteins were then amplified in a PCR uh, cloned using Gibson assembly, both E. coli and Bacillus subtilis were transformed and after a few tests correlation was initiated. And of course I have to analyze those spores and this was done by uh, assessing the presence of the fusion with western blot and I also plan to assess the exposition of, so of those proteins on the surface of the spores using immunofluorescence microscopy. The last step to do uh, which I plan to do in the following days would be to check the uh, inhibition activity of recombinant spores and this will be done uh, by performing MMP9 inhibition assay. Moving on to results, the results from a restriction analysis showed that obtained plasmid contain a proper sequence coding for uh, fusion proteins because as you can see in the wells corresponding to the clones I managed to obtain, these are the clones using CGA as an anchor protein. I've obtained three bands with their sizes corresponding to the expected ones. And in the case of the control, which is PXP1, and this is the plasmid carrying only the sequence uh, for the uh, CGA protein, I've obtained only two bands because in this case, one of the restriction enzymes behave like a single cutter. In here, in the gel which uh, on the wells corresponding to the T2 code diffusion, uh, I will also have a free bands with their sizes corresponding to the expected ones, but this gel is a little bit more tricky because the bands uh, from the negative control do not correspond to the expected ones. And this is mainly because um, PEXP3 was very troublesome for me to obtain in a high concentration and a high purity, which I suppose may interfere with the restriction analysis. Moving to the results from the Western blot, I have only managed to obtain the good results from T2 CODB fusion, and I couldn't obtain any for the fusions using CGA as an anchor protein. But if you take a look on the left, uh, this is the part of the membrane that was un uh, incubated using anti CODB antibodies. We can see many different bands, mainly this on this level, that do correspond to the CODB in this free state. By free I mean like it's native that is present normally on the spore surface, but I have no signal for the band corresponding in size and mass to the uh, T2 code B fusion. If you take a look on the right, here is a very tiny and thin band uh, that was detected using anti tim 2 antibodies, but the problem is that if you take a look at the calculated masses, the fusion of the T2 code B should be much higher than the fusion corresponding to T2 code Z. And this is what leads to the first conclusion from this project that the code B seems to be a bad candidate. And why I think that the problem is code B is that I've got a signal from T2 and not from the code B itself. As I mentioned, the fusions using CGA as an anchor protein need to be redone and checked once again using Western blot. And all of the recombinant spores need to be checked by immunofluorescence to assess the exposition 
of the fusion proteins on the presence of the spores. And last step would be to perform the MMP9 inhibition assay to check if my recombinant spores in fact have the ability to inhibit the MMP9 activity. That will be the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions. Thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, is there any questions for the speaker? Uh, I have one. Um, you choose uh, TAMP 2 and 3. Why not other 1 and 4? Um, because it was reported by many studies that during the periodontitis, the disturbance between balance of MMP9 and TIM2 and TIM3 is like the, the, the balance is the most disturbed and their production level gets even lower than in normal uh, situation. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, all of the works uh, were made at the laboratory of molecular bacteriology. And my supervisor and uh, my guidance was uh, Alessandro Negri. And uh, the topic is the analysis of social interactions between Dikia Solani and Bacillus subtilis mutant. Okay, so to uh, get into some intro introduction, uh, Dikia Solani is a gram-negative plant pathogen. Uh, it attacks a lot of different uh, plants that uh, are consumed by uh, humans around the world, but on the, our geographic uh, altitude, the most important uh, victim of uh, Dikia Solani is the potato. And uh, uh, Dikia Solani generates a lot of losses in the, uh, with the crops, and the like, most severe losses that I uh, could find uh, in the literature was in the Israel, and one, one third of all crops were like lost in, uh, to the Dikia uh, infections. And uh, through the previous uh, research at the Laboratory of Molecular Bacteriology, there was, uh, there was observed a very specific uh, interaction between Dikia Solani uh, strain IFB 102 and the isolated at, at this laboratory, uh, Bacillus subtilis MB73.2. Uh, okay, and the aim of the project was to describe the differences between the different, uh, the d different strains of Dikia and, uh, and this uh, Bacillus subtilis, and then investigate which genes are di directly respo responsible for, this, uh, for such an interaction. Okay, so uh, the swarming patterns are quite different from those, uh, for those two strains of Dikia Solani. The IPO has uh, a strategy of just going around the uh, plate, like in the, she's, uh, she's going uh, quite, quite fast as a, uh, as a on the plate. And the IFB is spreading more in the, let's say, cloudy pattern. And all of the uh, swarming uh, plates had a medium with the reduced glucose, uh, uh, the decreased, uh, decreased the glucose, uh, sorry, stężenie. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, it was to uh, uh, it was to promote the swarming uh, at the at the uh, with the bacteria. Okay, and uh, to the interaction it itself. There was a, there is a quite a big difference because the uh, IPO is getting uh, basically overgrown by the MB and uh, IPO is actively trying to escape, uh, while the IFB 
is also escaping, but uh, it creates a inhibition zone where the MB just cannot pass. And there is, we are not certain what exactly is happening at this neutra neutralization zone. Okay, so I also wanted to check whether those two strains has any differences in uh, like attacking the potato, but as you can see on those photos, there is not really any significant differences uh, about uh, them attacking those potatoes. And uh, to have a quick, quickly reminder, uh, I made a, uh, there is a comparison between those two strains. One is from Poland and different one is from Netherlands. Both of them are escaping as we have saw on the previous uh, slide, but the inhibition zone is present only uh, in the interaction with uh, IFB. And the genetic differences between those two strains is that the IFB cons uh, consists of six uh, single nucleotide polymorphism regions. And the further uh, investigation w consisted of checking whether those regions have uh, have any impact on the, on the interaction. And uh, there was made at the laboratory the deletion of least R gene. And as you can see, the IFB without, uh, like with the deletion of least R gene, is based, is, uh, doesn't have this uh, inhibition zone that I was talking about uh, previously. And, uh, and it's uh, just, uh, maybe it has a, uh, uh, impact on the interaction. Okay, uh, and the further plan consists of checking the different regions of uh, IFV102, whether they have any uh, significant impact on the, uh, on the interaction. And the, uh, the work is still ongoing. The, to the topic is very broad. And uh, the biggest, like the challenge is just to, is to obtain the uh, the, 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 the mutated strain because uh, f f during my work, the uh, yield from the uh, enzymatic cutting of the plasmids are quite low. Okay, so the conclu to conclude everything, the like mechanisms that are causing this uh, kind of interactions are quite complex and uh, inhibition zone itself may contain the solution uh, of the uh, of the uh, origins of this uh, interaction and uh, the the work isn't done we need to further investigate the SNPs and uh, if the work will go uh, in the good direction then we may be uh, will then we may be will discover the mechanism of plant protection because the like uh, chemical compounds used to uh, defend our crop uh, are not very effective because the DKI creates spores which can uh, residue in the uh, in the soil for like 30 years. So having uh, different mechanisms of defending our plants is quite valuable. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs> and. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Oh, cool. uh, you mentioned that uh, you inserted the plasmid to obtain um, a mutation uh, delta Lis R. Can you explain what uh, method did you use? Uh, <coughs> the the plasmid was constructed by Gibson SA, and then the uh, plasmid was uh, uh, was gathered from the transformed uh, cells, and then the, this plasmid was in, was tr uh, transported into the uh, into the IFB by electroporation. Um, are you planning to look at the molecular composition of this inhibitory uh, region? And if so, do you think that? by checking the molecules you have in this zone, it will help you to focus more on some region of the genome for the SNP research. Um, can I, uh, can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> Sorry. So the first part of the question was, 
Um, are you going to analyze the molecular composition of the inhibitory region? Uh, like, I would like to, but I don't have like much of the time left on my master okay. project. Project. And if you had time, <laughs> okay. do you think that by doing so you can focus more on some region of the gene for the SNP research? Uh, yes, I think so, because then I if we, uh, if we, for example, detect some kind of protein which is associated with this uh, kind of reaction, then we can just find the genes that are responsible for, the, for this uh, protein. Okay, thank you very much. Hello everyone, uh, today I'd like, like to talk about uh, how I predicted the structure of the C ring and the MF ring of the flagellar motor of Helicobacter pylori. Uh, I worked in the laboratory of molecular system simulation uh, with my supervisor, uh, Professor Raimund Kazimierkiewicz. First of all, uh, the, the, the first question we should ask uh, is why I did it. Uh, so as we, I think, all know, the Helicobacter pylori is a gram-negative bacteria that inhabits in around 50% of human population in the stomach. Mm -hmm. And it is proven that uh, there are two main factors uh, that uh, allows this bacteria to cause certain diseases, including cancer. First of all, uh, it re requires a high acid, uh, highly acidic environment. Uh, and second of all, uh, it has high motility. Now, uh, the thing is that both of those factors are related to the flagellar motor because the flagellar motor uh, spins the flagella that uh, propels the bacteria and it requires uh, the uh, gradient of protons uh, to run so the highly acidic environment is also needed. Now, uh, the flagellar motor is quite a big structure uh, over 100 nanometers in height and around 90 nanometers in uh, diameter. Uh, I will be, fo I was focusing on this part right here, the MF ring and the uh, C ring over here. Uh, this uh, comprises, uh, the, uh, this is called also the switch complex. It allows the, the, the motor to switch the direction of rotation. Uh, it is also important to say that uh, most of the motor and the switch complex as well uh, have a, an 18 fold symmetry. Uh, now, uh, to, mm, to predict the structure of uh, those rings, the, the switch complex, I had to use a cryo electron microscopy, uh, the sub averaging tomogram or the MAT, uh, as it's also called, uh, which can be seen over here. Uh, because it is quite a large structure, so X-ray like, uh, crystallography isn't enough, but uh, the, the map has a resolution of about 40 angstroms, so also the cryo uh, uh, crystallography results were needed. And these are those uh, crystallography models that I used. Uh, as you can see here, uh, they are uh, the models of uh, certain domains of the proteins uh, which, uh, com uh, which are the components of the switch complex uh, interacting with each other. This will be uh, important later. Firstly, let's focus on uh, the, uh, the domains of uh, each, uh, each protein individually. So we have a uh, the domain of 3F. This is the protein that constructs the MS ring. Uh, the rest of the proteins construct the C ring. So we have the FLE G. Uh, FLE M, FLE Y, and FLE N. Uh, the, there are two important things that we have to note. Uh, FLE Y is in two copies in one, let's call it a monomer of the switch complex. And uh, FLE Y, FLE N, and FLE M, 
both uh, have uh, so-called SPO A domain, and we know that FLE Y and FLE A uh, M interact with, uh, with, it, with each other. Now, these are only the domains, so uh, I had to use homology domain uh, modeling. Uh, I used for that uh, three different program, Raptor X, AlphaFold2, and Rosetta, uh, depending on the protein. Uh, and then the models were, uh, were analyzed for the similari similarity for to the crystallography uh, structures, and I chose the best ones. Uh, for that, I use RMSD analysis, so the root mean square analysis, deviation analysis. The lower scores here, the better, and the acceptable uh, score is four, so all of those uh, predicted uh, proteins are uh, uh, good enough. Now, uh, as I said before, uh, I had the models of, um, of the domain that interacts with each other, so I could uh, create the model uh, of the whole, uh, let's call it monomer, uh, of those two rings. Now, uh, there is one important exception, the FLE M and FLE Y. Uh, in here, uh, there weren't any model for that, so I need to perform molecular docking using class pro program, it is the protein-protein docking program. It gave me a score of minus uh, 1240.6. Uh, the lower the score, the better in here. And as you can, uh, could can remember, uh, I saw that um, both the flea M, flea Y, and flea M have the SPO A domain. And uh, in literature, uh, there was implied that uh, flea M and flea Y also interact uh, with that domain. Uh, so uh, here it is. Uh, and I uh, made an, uh, once again an RMSD analysis comparing this model to the flea M and flea Y model, it gave me uh, 1.8 uh, results, so it is also uh, a good result. And now, uh, I fitted the whole monomer to the map. Uh, to, uh, to do that, uh, I flexed the flexible linker uh, to fit it better. Now, here are two important things that we need to remember for this slide. First of all, the, the flea Y, so the, the orange one and the blue one uh, are not in the map. This is something that was shown in literature before and this is how it should be. And uh, we can see also the flea F, the green one, is also here in the C ring, uh, which wasn't shown previously, uh, but it is like this. Uh, now, as I told, uh, the switch complex is an 18-fold symmetry uh, complex, so I needed to perform symmetrical docking. I used uh, HSYM dock for this. Uh, I obtained a result of delta G of uh, minus 1,574.6 kilocalories per mole. Uh, so that's once again, the lower the better, so that is a good result. And what is maybe more Easily to, uh, easy to understand, uh, the diameter of the model is, uh, in here, is uh, 54 nanometers, which is exactly uh, the uh, uh, one that uh, is needed to fit uh, to the map. So for the conclusions, uh, first of all, uh, FLEA F is also a part of uh, the C-ring, which wasn't previously known. Uh, this model show it that it uh, really is. And second of all, FLEA M and FLEA Y uh, are interacting via the SPO A domain, uh, which was previously implied but never shown. Uh, so thank you. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is my model. This is still a lot more to do. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you for the presentation. You've probably done the overwhelming amount of work to build this composite model. Could you please share s how much individual individuals' proteins are in this model, just to quench my and others' curiosity? Uh, it is 108 different uh, protein chains in that model. 
Just for my better understanding here, uh, you said that you were supporting your uh, model with the X-ray structures mm -hmm. of the proteins. Are there any um, crystal structures obtained by you or are they only available from the databases? No, uh, from I could do X-ray crystal Okay, <laughs> okay, thanks. It is, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it is, there is not a lot of data uh, concerning this, any model, uh, models whatsoever. Uh, I chose, uh, this bacteria because the, the model is, uh, I think, the most well documented, uh, documented, but still there is only a handful of uh, X-ray crystallography structures and this map. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome everyone, my name is Natalia Nizhnik and today I would like to present you my master degree project which focuses on kinase and movement details. The project is under the supervision of Professor Raimund Kazmierkiewicz from Laboratory of Biomolecular System Simulations. By way of introduction, kinases are a molecular motor proteins which are able to move along microtubules. Based on the sequence homology, we can distinguish 14 families of kinases. All of them have a strongly conserved motor domain responsible for microtubule attachment and ATP hydrolysis required for protein movement. What we know so far about kinase movement is that it's unidirectional. Most kinases move toward the plus end of microtubules, but there are also some unique my, uh, kinases which move toward the minus end. One of those untypical minus end directed kinases is carnosine 14 NCD, which is also my protein of interest. NCD type kinases are a subset of kinases 14 uh, motors, which exist as a homodimers. They have been shown to play an important role in bipolar spindle assembly and chromosome segregation. The structure of kinases 14 differ from the structure of the other kinases. They have the motor domain localized at the C terminus, which is in contrast uh, with the other subfamilies of kinases, which have their motor domain localized either at the N terminus or in the middle of polypeptide chain. Previous study on kinasin 14 movement have indicated that those proteins are non-processive. Uh, they required two ATP molecules per run, which is in contrast to typical, the best known kinasin, uh, kinasin 1 which required only one ATP molecule. Recently, scientists also indicated importance of the uh, structures localized near to the catalytic core called uh, neck helix and neck mimic as an important element of minus and directed movement of kinase in 14. All studies conducted so far bring us closer to understanding the process of kinase in 14 movement, but this mechanism is still poorly understood. Taking this into account, the aim of the project is to explore details of kinasin 14 movement and to investigate important elements involved in this process. Knowing the role of kinasin 14 in cell division, it is important that we know exactly how it moves. To achieve the goal, I'm using molecular dynamic simulations, which allow to obtain trajectory illustrating atoms movement over time. For the simulation, I'm using martini force field, which is coarse grained force field. It groups four heavy atoms and its hydrogen atoms into one bit. Thanks to it, the system is simplified, which speed up computer calculations. The whole work in the project can be divided into three main parts. Kinesin 14 and CD molecular dynamic simulation, microtubule dynamic simulation, and simulation of complete merge system consisting of kinesin and uh, microtubule. Construction of merge system allows for better imitation condition in the cell and also increased chance of noticing important elements involved in kinesin 14 movement. 
And now I would like to present you the results which I obtained. Here you can see the trajectory obtained for kinesine 14 uh, NCD. Now you can see how atoms move over time. The individual proteins chain are marked with different color. Chain A is marked in green and chain B is marked in uh, pink. The obtained trajectory was analyzed and we assumed that, that the system is stable, which is visible in the uh, stability of potential energy over time. Uh, I also performed RMSD analysis, uh, which indicated that the protein has shown conformational changes from the original conformation over time. Additionally, I'll cal calculate RMSD fluctuation, which indicated residues that are fluctuating the most from their mean structure. And we conclude that high RMSD values correspond to regions of high flexibility that may play an important role in kinesine 14 movement. Those regions which I'm talking about are marked in this red box. I also obtained uh, the trajectory for microtubule fragments. Uh, here you can see heterodimers of alpha and beta tubulin. Uh, alpha tubulin is marked in purple and uh, beta tubulin is marked in pink. I constructed the merge system consisting of kinesine and uh, microtubule. And now I'm trying to perform molecular dynamic simulation on this complete merge system. So my project is not finished yet, but the results that I obtained so far are really uh, promising. Uh, to sum up, I obtained a stable structure of kinesine 14 NCD, which shows conformational changes over time. I also indicated residues, uh, which may play an important role during the kinesine 14 movement. Uh, I constructed a system consisting of kinesin and uh, microtubule, and uh, now I'm trying to perform molecular dynamic simulation on this complete merge system. Uh, so here are my sources, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, are there any questions? Okay. mentioned that you constructed uh, the merge system of both structures and can you explain how did you do that? Uh, yes, I used the last frames of the trajectories of kinesin and microtubule and then uh, using the distance restraint between appropriate atoms from kinesin and microtubule, I put them in the correct orientation with each other. Just out of the curiosity, how long does it take to obtain the results from the simulations? Because these are quite complex systems. Yes, yes, they are very complex systems. So this is I. Uh, this is why I'm uh, use Martini force field because it simplifies. Uh, simulation for the uh, system consisting of kinesin and microtubule takes about one day, but it is uh, hard to. Uh, set every uh, parameters that it work. <laughs> okay. Uh. What kind of computer resources are you using in your work? Uh, so what kind of server? Uh, I use Gromax. Gromax. Program. Yeah. Computer yeah. Computer system. Uh, I use computer system from from our department. Okay, thank you very much. So, hi everyone, thank you for having me here today. So the topic of my presentation is designing and studying physicochemical properties of peptides and peptidomimetics blocking PD-1-PDR1 complex formation. So, 
PD1, PDL1 uh, complex is an example of immune checkpoints. Immune checkpoints are standard components of immune system, of human's body immune system, and the primary purpose is to regulate the intensity of immune response so that it's not too high or not too low, depending on the type of checkpoint, because we've got the stimulatory and the inhibitory ones. So as you can see here, the PD1 protein is expressed in this example uh, on the surface of T cell, and the PDL1 protein is expressed on the surface of tumor cells uh, in several types of cancers, such as melanoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, or non-small cell lung cancer. However, it's also expressed on the surface of dendritic cells and, for example, macrophages. So whenever such complex formation occurs between the T cell and the tumor cell, it leads to the T cell energy and eventually tumor escape and cancer progression. So there are already several types of immunotherapy uh, targeting the immune checkpoints, including the PD-1, PD-L1 complex. However, in this study, we did not decide to design novel new antibody. Instead of this, we decided to design peptides and their mimetics uh, for several reasons. So first of all, peptides are way less expensive to synthesize, so it could be a well, potential benefit for future patients, as well as they are smaller than the antibodies, so that uh, they can easily uh, penetrate the tissues, including the microenvironment. And last but not least, the half-life is counted in hours, not in days, like with uh, antibodies. So they do not accumulate in tissues like antibodies, and due to that fact, they are associated with way less immune-related adverse effects. So here are our preliminary results from MMGBSA analysis, which is a molecular mechanics generalized burn surface area, which is an in silico technique used uh, for uh, energy decomposition that uh, pretty much tells us which amino acid residues are the most important ones. By saying the most important ones, I mean which ones contribute to the binding strength of the complex the most. So here you can see the, uh, these residues on PDL1 surface and on PD1 surface. And based on that, we designed 13 peptides in total based on the surface of PD1 hotspots. So these most important residues and we distinguished two groups based on the hotspot and eventually we proceeded further with two of them because we were also simultaneously running the wet lab experiments such as surface plasmon resonance which pretty much told us that the peptide 10 is uh, the best potential drug candidate based on the kinetic, kinetic constants. And at the same time, uh, our SPR data showed that peptide 4 does not bind to the PDL1 protein, so we use it as a negative control in a further analysis. So uh, here is um, the workflow of my project. So with these designed peptides, I did the molecular docking to see whether the binding interface uh, is pretty much similar to the original PD-1, PDL1 complex. Then I uh, calculated the kinetic constants, and just to confirm our initial findings, uh, after that I repeated the MMGBSA analysis to see where are the hotspots on the structure of our peptides, and based on that results I designed peptidomimetics by simply mutating the previous residues with non-canonical amino acids based on the chemical similarity, and at the very end I also repeated the MMGBSA to see whether the hotspots remain the same for the peptidomimetics and to compare overall binding-free energy differences between peptidomimetics and our reference peptide. So here are the results uh, from uh, molecular docking. So I used our anomer data, and uh, so there were several structures in total. First one was the crystal structure, and then two next ones were uh, peptide 10 enamer family 1 and 2, because our enamer data showed us that these two families account for more than 70% of total possible conformations of this peptide, so that's why we have two of them. And the last one, as I said, the negative control. So uh, I used the UNRES, so United Residue Coarse Grain Force Field with Multiplex Replica Exchange Molecular Dynamic Simulation. Uh, and after that, I also used the Beanless Weighted Histogram Analysis Method to cluster them into two clusters, so the best similarity and the dominant ones. And as you can see here, obviously the crystal structure was the one most similar to the original PD-1, PD-L1 complex, and the, uh, the negative control was the least similar one. So here are these structures. We've got one additional one, which was our positive control. So here is the PD-L1 protein and fragment of PD-1 protein uh, trimmed to match the sequence of designed peptides. Now, after that, I also used the unrest force fields, but this time with canonical molecular dynamic simulation. And uh, I calculated the association and dissociation rate of these peptides. So as you can see here, the uh, one which binds with the highest strength is the 
that's taken from uh, animal family one, but it's also worth noting that the association rate of the crystal structure is approximately 10 times higher than both of them. Due to that fact, it indicates that there are some conformational reorganization during the binding process. So after that, again, I did MMGBSA to see where are the hotspots. So again, the uh, amino acid residues which contribute the most to the binding strength of this complex. So in our case, it was the isoleucine 121 and isoleucine 129. And based on that result, I further mutated them by, uh, well, pretty much by uh, changing them, by replacing them uh, with non-canonical amino acids based on the chemical similarity. So here is the example structure of the peptide mimetic I designed, and here are our final results. So as you can see, I designed 14 peptide mimetics in total, and uh, here you can see on the right-hand side of this table the uh, delta in Gibbs free energy, and based on that, I've chosen three out of total 14 peptide mimetics to be uh, further analyzed in vitro. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, they are currently being tested, I mean, they should be at least. So yeah, but it's also worth noting, as you can see here, the binding, uh, uh, the delta of binding free energy of these two first peptide mimetics is way more favorable than other, but, but I didn't choose them due to the fact that the uh, hotspots did not remain the same. So the residues 121 and 129 were not the hotspots anymore. So that's why I decided not to pursue further analysis with them. At the very end, I wanted to say thank you very much for anyone who participated in any aspect of these projects, and especially to my supervisor, Professor Adam Sierazan. And well, it was kind of a brief presentation, so if you're interested in more methodology, workflow, and well, experimental design, just go ahead, scan this QR code that will take you directly to our peptides paper. So thank you very much, and I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you very much for your nice talk. Questions? Hey, uh, thank you for the talk. I have a question. This peptide can be used to prevent cancer or as part of uh, chemotherapy? Uh, not chemotherapy, as uh, well, instead of immunotherapy. We okay, so not as prevention. No, not as prevention. Okay. As a drug. Mm -hmm. And how can they be delivered? Uh, subcutaneously or intravenously, but I'm not sure about it. But okay, because they need to stay stable yeah, sure, until they reach the target cells, right? Sure, but first we would have to uh, calculate the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics properties, and then we could decide. One last question. I'm just curious, why did you decide to design specifically peptidomimetics instead of some kind of inhibitor of PD-1? Well, this is an inhibitor. I mean, of the small molecules, right? So, okay, so, uh, so the interaction between PD-1 and PD-L1 surface, so this is not a typical uh, ligand receptor type of binding. I mean, this is not a typical, uh, we do not have, for example, one deep binding pocket to the which the ligand binds. Instead of that, we do have uh, two relatively large surfaces, which are approximately 800 to 2000 square angstroms, on the surface of which we've got scattered plenty of shallow binding pockets, so our uh, hotspots. And uh, yeah, so the reason why is due to that fact, because the Small molecules cannot really bind to all of these uh, hotspots, so they could be, well, uh, have really low specificity, so it might lead to, uh, well, some severe toxicity and eventually uh, way more adverse drug reactions if we chose them to do so. So, yeah, that's why we did it. Because PTI, so protein-protein interactions were uh, considered to be 20 or 30 years ago even as undesirable because of that fact. Okay, one really quick question. <laughs> okay, so I just have a question because uh, you said um, that you were, you know, talking about the, the uh, monoclonal antibodies also. And the question is, did you try to, for example, test the potency or the biological activity of your uh, potential drugs? Uh, if yes, what was the reference? You mean the in vitro, right? 
Yeah. So yeah, so we were running, as I said before, the wet lab experiments. So uh, we there was bioluminescent cell-based assay of immune immune blocked assay based on the PD-1 PDL1 complex, and we compared it to the anti-PDL1 uh, antibody. And so which which of them specifically? Which uh, peptide chain? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, but uh, oh, do you mean the antibodies? So the antibodies. Uh, yes. No, so this is not like a f uh, antibody for the clinical use. This is only for the lab use. However, uh, so our conclusions were that that we designed this peptide and it has well-defined structure and it disrupts the uh, interaction between PD1 PDL1 uh, complex. However, it's rather weak binding when comparing to this antibody. Mm -hmm. So that's why we continued to uh, design the peptide mimetics that can, well, hopefully enhance the biophys biophysical properties okay. of this potential drug. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. conference I want to tell about my master thesis uh, with uh, working title the role of CD73 in uh, regulation of the tumor microenvironment in breast cancer progression under supervision of professor Patricia Koshauka and Pavel Serafin uh, who is a different person it, this is just coincidence <laughs> <laughs> a project was conducted in the laboratory of cell biology and immunology. And it is essential to note that uh, my master thesis is just a part of uh, project under Opus funding uh, with title the role of uh, CD73 uh, in breast cancer promotion progression processes and its evaluation as a therapeutic target using induced mammary carcinoma of the most mammary glands as a model. Uh, let's move to a quick introduction what is uh, CD73. Uh, ECTO 5' prime nucleotidase, which is the other name for uh, CD73, uh, catalyzes uh, conversion of uh, 5' prime AMP to adenosine, which leads to a various uh, physiological and pathological uh, effects. Uh, physiologically, um, adenosine medi mediated uh, immune system uh, suppression uh, is essential to uh, keeping uh, immune system homeostasis. But in terms of uh, um, solid tumor growth, uh, the developing of hypoxia and inflammation um, leads to uh, increase of uh, CD73 levels and accumulation of uh, adenosine, which is particularly correlated with uh, um, anti-tumor uh, immune system uh, response suppression. Uh, various studies have shown that uh, mm inhibition of CD73 will lead to uh, a better, uh, better prognosis. Uh, this is also the case for breast cancer, which is the most diagnosed uh, cancer among women. Um, and, uh, but the problem is uh, breast cancers are uh, heterogenic. Uh, and um, as you can see here, uh, various clinical studies uh, shown that uh, uh, higher levels of CD73 uh, correlates, correlates with uh, lower overall survivability. Uh, but um, there are uh, conflicting data uh, regarding it depends on um, peer, year, or HER2 status. Uh, some studies even shown that uh, uh, higher levels of CD73 may predict good prognosis. Um, but meta-analysis uh, proposed that uh, correlation between 73 and uh, clinical outcome may depend on other factors, such as uh, age or previous treatment. Uh, moving to the results of the uh, studies of the project before I take part in it, uh, you can see on figure A that uh, wild-type mice uh, had increased overall survivability compared to uh, mice with CD. 73 knockout. And uh, on C and D, you can see that uh, CD73 uh, knockout uh, correlates with uh, reduced overall survivability uh, with correlation of 
uh, changes in uh, first tumor growth uh, in wild type between wild type and uh, CD73 knockout. But on uh, figure E and F, you can see that um, CD73 knockout ca caused that um, subsequent tumors develop er earlier and uh, almost two times faster. And uh, moving to aim of the study, I want to uh, analyze changes in immune cell types, e epithelial mesenchymal uh, transition, and stem cells markers in the microenvironment, uh, both in primary and secondary mammary gland tum tumors. And I want to examine uh, the extracellular adenosine metabolism using mammospheres. In project, uh, we used uh, induced uh, marine breast cancer model, but uh, in stage when I started my master thesis, uh, material was in the form of uh, paraffin scrappings. And uh, I want to analyze vascula vascularization, epithelium the human transition, and uh, lipid metabolism using uh, immunohistochemistry, immunofluorescence, and uh, image uh, processing. And I also want to uh, conduct in vitro uh, analysis on cell lines uh, to evaluate uh, morphological changes in, in mammospheres and uh, evaluate uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition and stem cell antigen expression and multidrug resistance um, in both cases using Western blot technique. And uh, here you can see all uh, antigens I want to check. Uh, for now, I uh, finished the uh, analysis for first three. Uh, rest is on various stages of uh, analyzing, analyzing or uh, staining. Uh, so moving to results of these uh, three uh, antigens, uh, here you can see uh, in wild type mice, um, there is uh, lower uh, infiltration uh, by uh, li B lymphocyte, lymph lymphocyte uh, in uh, subsequent mm, subsequent uh, tumors uh, but as you can see on C and D uh, this is not uh, mm, this is not cause uh, b mm, because uh, CD73 knockout uh, here we can see that uh, mm, depending on uh, peer and uh, peer status CD73 knockout uh, may have different results. Uh, in uh, peer plus status, mm, knockout costs uh, higher uh, infiltration by lymphocyte B, and uh, in peer minus status, uh, knockout costs uh, lower infiltra infiltration. Moving to uh, CD8, uh, there is no difference uh, between first and uh, subsequent uh, tumors. Uh, and uh, here you can see mm, that uh, in wild type mice, uh, in peer minus status, uh, there is uh, higher infiltration by uh, cells uh, with uh, CD8 uh, expression. But uh, in uh, case of CD73 knockout, uh, these do not occur. Uh, moving to macrophages, uh, here is also no uh, changes in uh, first and uh, secondary mm, tumors, and uh, there is uh, no uh, changes uh, between wild type and CD73 knockout um, in case of uh, peer status. Uh, here are my in initial conclusions, and uh, thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you for Thank you for your presentation. Okay, I don't oh, it's working now. Uh, so you've mentioned earlier the big table with the antigens. Um Yes, this one? This one? Yes. And are you planning to analyze this uh, all antigens uh, during your master thesis? Because, um, because I mean, it looks like uh, lots of work. Uh, I decided that I will uh, prolong my uh, graduation 
for two months uh, because I really want to uh, check everything. So I think maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and I, I would like to invite the deputy dean for a few words. Thank you, Claudia. Okay, so we are now getting to the end of the conference, but still waiting for the most, I think, exciting part of the conference, so award decision. That's why I invite you for the last coffee break now. We have uh, 30 minutes uh, for the coffee break, and all of the employees of interested companies, I invite just now after the meeting, this panel, to the dean's office for a short mm, award decision. And at 3 o'clock, invite all of you for the award ceremony, so have a nice time for the coffee break now.
sekundy. Dobrze, szanowni państwo, więc z miłą chęcią otwieram ostatni, ostatni krok naszej konferencji, czyli uroczystość wręczenia nagród, na które państwo czekaliście. Oczywiście na samym początku musimy pogratulować wszystkim z państwa, bo złożyliście państwo ogromny trud w, w te prezentacje, w wasze badania, które trwały no nie tylko ostatnie kilka miesięcy, ale to jest tak naprawdę zwieńczenie waszej pracy przez ostatnie kilka lat na naszej uczelni, także chcemy wam serdecznie pogratulować. Widzimy ogromny profesjonalizm w waszych badaniach i w waszych prezentacjach, także wielkie brawa dla was wszystkich. Natomiast oczywiście niektórych z państwa chcemy wyróżnić w sposób szczególny, e, ufundowanymi nagrodami, także najpierw oddam głos panu, panu prezesowi Marianowi Kawczyńskiemu, pani Jolancie ze firmy Polfarm, aby mogli zabrać głos i wyróżnić tych student, tego studenta, których, którzy Państwo ujęli się tutaj swoimi wystąpieniami. Przyłączając się do słów, bardzo, bardzo wszystkim gratuluję. Ja z Bułgarii jestem związany od samego początku i obserwuję, że z roku na rok wystąpienia są coraz lepsze. E, niedługo będzie tak, że wszyscy, którzy tu będą występować, staną się kandydatami do Nagród Nobla przy poziomie prac, jakie reprezentujecie. Także wszystkim bardzo serdecznie gratulujemy, no ale nie wszyscy mogą być nagrodzeni. Jedną z nagród ufundowała firma Kawaska, jest to mikroskop optyczny firmy Laika Mikrosystem. I nagroda została przyznana pani Patrycji Kawie. Trochę ważne, tak. A teraz jeszcze krótka, krótka informacja. Jedność nazwy firmy i nazwiska. <głosy> Dlatego, że ja przez 16 lat miałem na nazwisko Kap. W 16 roku życia moi rodzice stwierdzili, że muszą zmienić nazwisko, bo Marli nie wiem z jakiego powodu. I teraz nazywam się Kawczyński. Ale... Jak zakładałem firmę Kawaska 23 lata temu, zastanawiałem się nad tym, jaką nazwę firmie nadać. Bio coś albo lap coś. I doszedłem do wniosku, a po co wymyślać, jeśli mogę wrócić do nazwiska rodowego. Niech się firma nazywa Kawa, a do tego spółka. No spółka w skrócie jest SKA, no więc nazywa się kawa.sk. To tyle wyjaśnień. Tak, drugą z nagród ufundowała firma Polfarm, a także też zapraszam przedstawicieli tej firmy. Szanowni Państwo, więc ja mam dzisiaj przyjemność reprezentować firmę Polfarma Biologics i ogłosić laureata nagrody tej firmy, czyli nagrodą jest ten roczny, roczny płatny staż w naszej firmie. Tak jak w zeszłym roku wybór był bardzo trudny i zdecydowaliśmy się przyznać dwie nagrody i teraz przedstawię nazwiska tych osób. Pierwszą osobą jest pan Jacek Sobczak. Bardzo proszę. I jeszcze druga osoba, ale wcale nie druga, tylko pierwsza również. Martyna Ochocińska. Bardzo gratuluję. I gratulacje dla wszystkich, bo prezentacje były naprawdę bardzo interesujące. Dziękujemy bardzo. Jeszcze poproszę o zabranie głosu przedstawiciela firmy Kajagen. Ja witam wszystkich bardzo serdecznie. Mam tą przyjemność reprezentować firmę Kajagen. 
serdecznie wam wszystkim gratuluję. Widać ogrom naprawdę pracy i, i serca, ile, ile włożyliście w przygotowanie tych prezentacji, a tak naprawdę streszczenie waszej pracy magisterskiej w ciągu, nie wiem, siedmiu minut, więc jestem pod ogromnym wrażeniem. E, I tak jak w, w roku poprzednim, ale w zeszłym roku była to firma Blirt, e, postanowiliśmy ufundować nagrodę jest w postaci laptopa e, studentowi i nie powiem, że miałam trudności z wyborem e, tej jednej osoby, ale tutaj po konsultacjach Nagroda wędruje do, do, mam nadzieję, że dobrze zapamiętałam imię i nazwisko, Michała Dnickiego. Dziękujemy naszym zaprzyjaźnionym firmom, a mi jeszcze pozostał tylko zaszczyt wręczenia ostatniej, ale nie ostatniej nagrody, nagrody imienia pani profesor Anny Jadwigi Podhajskiej. No, skoro już państwo nie mieliście okazji pracować, natomiast my jeszcze mieliśmy okazję poznać panią profesor, dlatego tym bardziej jest nam niezmiernie miło, że właśnie nagrodę imienia pani profesor Podhajskiej mogliśmy ustanowić na tym wydziale i wręczyć ją jako właśnie nagrodę dziekana. A ta nagroda dziekana w tym roku wędruje dla pana Alana Warszawskiego. Zapraszam pana. Panie Alanie, serdeczne gratulacje. Dziękuję ogromu bardzo. pracy włożonego w prezentację. Wszystkiego dobrego. Jeszcze zdjęcie. <głosy> Dziękuję. Szanowni Państwo, no nie pozostaje mi nic innego, jak zakończyć tę naszą piękną uroczystość i zaprosić Was, drodzy studenci, bo to nie jest koniec. Dla Was oczywiście jeden z ważniejszych momentów na zakończenie studiów, ale pamiętajcie, że w przyszłym tygodniu spotykamy się na ważnym też wydarzeniu, na Dniu Studenta, na który bardzo serdecznie Was zapraszamy. To będzie już może w innym charakterze trochę spotkanie bardziej rozrywkowo-integracyjne, ale mam nadzieję, że wszyscy spotkamy się przy wspólnej zabawie na wydziale, abyśmy mogli jeszcze świętować przedwakacyjnie zakończenie tego roku. Także bardzo serdecznie zapraszam. A dzisiaj oficjalnie zamykam naszą konferencję. Jeszcze raz gratulując wszystkim Państwa i Waszym promotorom, opiekunom z ogromu pracy, który włożyliście w tą i tą, tą prezentację, wasze wyniki i też myślę, że ogromne brawa słuchajcie dla naszego samorządu studenckiego, dla naszych doktorantów, którzy prowadzili sesję, bo spisali się na medal z roku na rok. Ta profesjonalność nam wzrasta i dziękujemy wam serdecznie za ten ogrom pracy, który włożyliście. Dziękuję bardzo i do zobaczenia. Widzimy się za rok, panie Wiktorze, dziękuję bardzo.